testing and continue. Tom's, please get the delegate soon to the hall. Will the convention please be in order? We have with us this morning, bring the invocation, an old friend that hardly needs any introduction to many of you. Uh, he's been around almost as long as I have. He's a strong believer in the trade union movement. He's been on our program, brought the invocation, had a few words to say uh, down through the years. It's my pleasure at this time to present to you the Reverend Alan Johnson of Law of Mississippi to bring the invocation. Brother Johnson. Thank you, President Ramsey. It's a joy to greet this group this morning and to see you. We heard the deliberations on yesterday. That five of the many good things will be coming forth this day. And we want to share with you now for a moment of devotion. First Corinthians, ninth chapter, beginning with seventh grade. And must Barnabas and I alone keep working for our living while you supply these others? What soldier in the army has to pay his own expense? Have you ever heard of a farmer who harvests his crop, doesn't have the right to eat some of it, but shepherds take care of a flock of sheep and goats and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk. I'm not merely quoting the opinions of men as to what is right. I'm telling you what God's law said. When the law God gave to Moses, he said that you must not put a muzzle on an ox to keep it from eating when it is treading out the wheat. Do you suppose God was thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he also thinking about us? Of course he was. He said this to show us that Christian workers should be paid by those they help. Those who do the plying and thrashing should expect some share of the harvest. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I think when we look at these words carefully, they show that all workers are worthy of their hire. No man ought to labor in vain. But the prophets ought not go to others, the prophets that we have made as we labor. But we are worthy to share in. May God bless his word and let us bow now for a moment of prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we pray to thee as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to recognize thee as the God of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Kennedy Brothers, and Humphrey. We recognize thee as our God, Lord Ramsey's God, Tom Knight. And all of these are labor leaders who are in the field to help men have a better life, life more abundant. For you did say you, you would come into the world that men might have life and have it more abundant, a better way of living, better things of life be shared by all mankind. We thank thee this morning for are coming together the kind of fellowship in this biracial group that means so much to working men and women and boys and girls everywhere. Be thou with us in all of our deliberations this day. <coughs> Guide us and lead us in the way that will be pleasing to thee. And we shall go down from this place that we will be rewarded by our own thinking that we have done our best, we have had our input. But it is in such a deliberate body as this, for there's fairness and democracy that men grow and have that understanding and make this state and this nation a better place. Bless now, we pray in our Son's name and for our sake. Amen. 
Thank you, Reverend. Always a pleasure to have you with us. I'd like to make a couple of announcements before we get the business session started. Some of you were not in the convention hall to hear the results of the vote tabulation yesterday on the roll call vote, and I'd like to read it out to you so you can write it down for future reference if you need that. The vote was as follows, 17,840 yes, 7,825 no, a total of 25,665 votes cast, which is far beyond the two-thirds vote necessary. So the convention did on its roll call vote yesterday endorse R.E. Stanton, the first Democratic primary. Now, after the vote was tabulated, after I uh, saw that the convention had gone on record in this direction, I called the Denton headquarters uh, last evening and see if there's a possibility of having Mr. Denton come before the convention. They've agreed to have Mr. Denton here tomorrow morning around 11 o'clock. I've requested, <laughs> I've requested that he bring Walter Payton with him if Walter Payton is available and found out that Walter was out of the state, but Walter's mother will be with the candidate. Now, many of you know Walter's mother. She's a member of our Amalgamated Coal Workers Union in Columbia. She's been a delegate to this convention herself years in the past. 11 o'clock in the morning, the candidate will be here. Uh, now, if the, I'd like at this point to declare the convention in executive session to receive the report of the audit committee. Uh, we, <clears throat> our tradition in the past is we don't want the press or any outside people having access to our financial transactions. So I'd ask the sergeant at arms to please keep the press out of this particular part of the meeting. We'll let you know as soon as it's over with. And uh, Ms. Kennedy, we just won't get this in the record. You can just uh, wait. Uh, if you want to shut it off, be okay. Move the adoption of this report. You've heard the committee's report and a motion to uh, adopt. We do have a second. Any discussion on the motion? Jack pointed out earlier, any local that would like to have a copy of the report can fill out the form, it'd be mailed to you. All in favor of the motion to adopt the committee's report signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. I would like to personally commend this committee for having done such an excellent job. And Jack, I think there's a couple of your committee members back there somewhere. I saw Billy still walk in on you. You want to chew him out, he's back, <laughs> right back in that corner. Then you handle it back. Well, anyhow, we do appreciate that uh, good job. But this committee has to go to work before the convention gets here. And I can personally testify to the fact that they spent a lot of time in getting the facts together for this report. Now, this time, my, it's my pleasure to present to you an old friend of ours, a man who's been with us before. He is the racing director of the AFL-CIO, including the state of Mississippi. He's uh, been very cooperative with this organization since he's been regional director. He will uh, have a few words to say, uh, even though we overlooked putting something in the agenda about the fact Jim Sauter was supposed to make an address. Nevertheless, I've advised him he was expected to have a few words to say. Uh, it's my pleasure now to present to you Jim Sala, regional director of the FLCL. Jim. Thank you, Floyd. Mr. Chairman, brothers and sisters, 
and a special hello to my predecessor, Bob Starnes. Hi, Bob. It's nice to be back in Mississippi again. One of my fellows said to me yesterday when I come in, he said, Jim, what does it take, a tornado to get you over here? Well, that's really not the truth. It's the fact that your organization does run well, the fact that you do have competent people who take advice from the delegates <coughs> of your conventions and who carry out the policies and the programs of the AFL-CIO. And I'm quite happy to add, with the assistance of our two staff people, and I'd like to introduce them. You know them, but I'd like to introduce them anyway. Dan Ory and Jim Touchstone in the back. So with that kind of help that you have here, with that kind of help that you have, it's really not necessary to me to come over and belabor you. You know, I travel a lot. Sometimes I don't get to the place where I'm supposed to be on time. And it comes to mind that I did come into a place and the program was already on. And I snuck in through the side door and up on the dais Somebody was addressing a group of people, and in a very low voice, I leaned over and I asked the fellow, I said, who's speaking? And he told me who was speaking. And I said, well, how long has he been speaking? And he says, too long. And I said, well, what's he saying? He says, he won't tell us. <laughs> well, I'm not going to speak long, and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about us. I'm going to talk about labor. I'm going to talk about who we are what we are, where we come from, where we should be going. We're a special interest group. Make no mistake about it. We've been accused of that. We're a very, very, very special interest group because we represent people in the whole range of activities. For those of you who do not know, we were in the forefront of public education. We fought for the Social Security bill protect our older citizens when they retire. We fought for Medicaid, Medicare, a whole lot of social legislation. And yes, we were in the forefront, including your officers, of the civil rights fight long before it became fashionable. Long, long, long before it was the right thing to do. We were colorblind in unions. We were looking out for the economic side of our members. I was talking to the Reverend a little bit this morning and we talked about economics. You know, I don't care what rights you have, minority rights, civil rights, none of them are worth the tinker's damn if you don't have that economic right to be able to go to those places, to be able to participate. So we're a special interest group. And now we're under attack. We're under attack by a lot of right-wing reactionary people. And for those of you who saw the film, Right-Wing Machine, if it scared you, you should have been scared. Because they're shooting at us. It's you and you. Every single one of you in here could be considered that labor boss. You don't get paid. They don't print that in the editorials. But when they talk about the labor bosses, they're talking about the chair ladies in the needle garment trades. They're talking about the officers of an IBEW local, of a CWA local, labor bosses. They're talking about the tremendous amount of salaries that you get. And it's outright lies and distortions, but there's a reason behind it. And it's not really the economic reason of bargaining for our members. It's the fact that they want to keep us so busy eking out a living that we cannot enjoy the better things of life, including participation in our government. I came in a little late yesterday, and I watched an exercise in democracy. I watched opposing sides with different points of view put forth what they thought was best for the organization. I don't know the candidates, and it's really not necessary that I know. It's necessary that you know because you live here in Mississippi. But it's equally necessary to understand that the only time labor has been defeated is when we allow our enemies to make us forget who the enemies are. I would 
hope when you go out of this convention that you would go out of here united. Go out of here recognizing the fact that you're going to support people who have indicated that they're going to support you. And that's what it's all about. That's what you're here for, to represent those people back in the shop, not only across the bargaining table, but in the political and civic activities of our life. And I would hope that the person you picked answered the questions right and told you that some of the interests that you have that he's going to look out for. I sincerely hope that. Because I get disturbed when I look at the number of people that we have supported and the kind of support that we've gotten from them. I think a classic example is labor law reform, and I'm going to talk a little bit on that. Labor law reform. In the seven states that I'm privileged to represent, we have 14 senators. Nine of them were endorsed and supported by Coke money, your money that you donated. And out of those nine, we have one who has indicated that he will support the labor law reform bill. And that happens to be Jim Sasser from Tennessee. The other eight who we supported, all they found a myriad of excuses. You know, this is a ripoff. This is going to hurt the American public. This is going to raise unemployment. This is going to cause inflation. In fact, it's, it's really going to do away with motherhood. And they have found every single excuse in the world not to support us, not to support you. And I don't think we ought to give them a free ride. I think that we ought to get a little angry, that we ought to start taking our special interest case to the public, to the people that you deal with every day, across the grocery store line when you're waiting in line, at your PTA meetings, and even the people you talk to. Stand up and say, I'm that labor person. I'm that one you read in the paper. Do I have horns? Am I that bad? Is it wrong to seek the economic benefits to allow us to live a little better? And it reminds me that someone once said that when they asked Samuel Gompers what unions wanted, and he answered more, well, that's not really true because there was more to it. He said more carpets on the floor, more pictures on the wall, more time to enjoy the fruits of our labor. And if we get labor law reform, that's going to help. Those of you sitting in this audience may not know, but there has not been a piece of pure pro-labor legislation passed since 1935. And you read the papers like I do, big labor, George Meany with the AFL-CIO walks into the White House and tells them what we want, how we want it, and when we want it. But the fact remains, not one single piece of pro-labor legislation since 1935, the Wagner Act. Now, in 1947, they did a number on us. They passed Taft Hartley, which made it a little tougher to maintain our unions in 20 states. The infamous right to work for less law. And it's kept us so busy protecting our flanks that we haven't been able to go out and do the job that's necessary to organize the unorganized, not only to help them, but let's get a little bit selfish to protect those benefits that we now enjoy. And then in 1959, they amended the law again, the Labor Management Disclosure Act, which in effect was trying to say that labor people were a little shady and a little crooked, and maybe it was time to keep a closer tabs on them. And maybe it was time to take the power from the labor bosses and give it back to the rank and file. And one of the things that sticks out in my memory is there was an airline strike going on at the same time. And prior to this Labor Management Disclosure Act, union officials had the right to act for their memberships in negotiating contracts and signing for them. And we were called labor bosses and thwarting the will of the majority. But in 1959, that changed. And the first test came about with the airline strike. And the president even met with the president of the machinist. And they tried to settle the strike. But the rank and file said, no, we want more. Not them big labor bosses, but the rank and file. All of a sudden, the editorials in the paper come out and said that the rank and file are not listening to the labor statesmen. Something's wrong. Now, they can't have it both ways. You people were elected to come here to represent your members. And that's the American way, democracy. 
But that's the kind of laws that we had passed against us. Labor law reform. Last night's paper. Read the editorial, I don't even know the name of the paper, but one of the first lines in the editorial was, let's look at the issue behind the issue of labor law reform. And it went on to say that labor unions are not organizing as fast as they say we should, and therefore we're trying to get labor law reform passed in the Congress. Nothing could be further from the truth. Labor law reform is nothing more than the promise that was made to the American worker in 1935 that you shall have the right to self-organization and the protection and the pursuit of that right to engage in collective bargaining. My, have we taken a beating in 43 years. I dare say that most of you in this room have seen the kind of actions that have taken place when you're out on an organizing campaign. And again, stop and think of what the real reason behind it is. They don't want us to come together to identify our problems and to find solutions for them. And how best to do that is to keep us apart, to keep us fighting. I told you I wouldn't talk too long, but I get wound up a little bit. Let's talk, basically, what is labor law reform? It gives no right to any union now in existence. It gives no additional power for unions to go out and organize. And it takes nothing away from law-abiding management. Absolutely not one thing does it take from it. But it will penalize those lawbreakers. And why shouldn't they be penalized? When we break the law as individuals, we're penalized. In, in one of those times when I was late for a meeting, I was in North Carolina trying to go from Winston-Salem across the top of the state to Asheville. And I was late, and I was in a hurry. And my foot got a little heavy on that accelerator. And I broke the law, and I was caught. And they immediately took me to a justice of the peace and dispensed justice on me. Fifty-five hours worth of justice. And I paid my fine before I left that state. <coughs> Yet a company like J.P. Stevens, for 13 years, has been able to thwart the law. We need labor law reform, not for us, but for those employees who want the right of the promise that was made to them 43 years ago. What we're talking about is increasing the size of the board. And our right-wing enemies say that we're going to pack the board. Well, let me tell you, we don't pick the board. It's picked by the President of the United States. And though he's a fellow Georgian, I wouldn't exactly call him one of our best friends. He picks them, and they're confirmed by the Senate. So that just blows that argument out the window, packing the board. Basically, what it's doing is to put more people there to handle the terrific amount of cases that the law-breaking employers have put on us. I think you ought to remember that when you see these editorials and answer them. And the other one says that uh, uh, the time limits have to be stopped. A company can conceivably appeal and appeal and appeal, and in Hartwell, Georgia, the Monroe Shop Company appealed for 11 years. Justice denied for 11 years. So we're saying to set time limits as to when a lawyer has to appeal a case and then let them hear it and give us a speedy decision, whether we win or lose. The need for a preliminary injunction if an employee gets fired. That happens. That happens in almost every campaign in the South. And if I was an employer <coughs> and inclined to break the law and my employees wanted to organize, the first thing I would do is to get that most important employee in the union organization and fire them. Why shouldn't I? There's no penalty. They may slap my hand a little later, four or five years later, but I'll bet you you won't get a union in that shop. So we're saying give the board, not us, but give the National Labor Relations Board the authority to immediately seek a court injunction if an employee was fired, fired for union activity and put that employee back in the plant. Can you imagine, if you will, an employee that was fired Monday being brought back into the plant on Friday, and then the union organizer can stand up in front of a group of people and say, yes, the law protects your right to self-organization. Now, that's something for the worker. It doesn't give the union anything. Compensation. Now, if an employee is fired, maybe four or five years later, 
he may get some money back. But the law reads that every single penny he has made has to be deducted from what the employer pays. And you're going to have to work someplace. You're going to have to get money somewhere. So in effect, the employer has no penalty. And I'm a firm believer that if you want to deter lawbreakers, including those of us that speak, fine them. Make it cost them a little bit. There's a few other things, but I guess that's some of the most important things. But what's your job? I say your job because, you know, you're that labor boss that they talk about. I think your job is to start standing up and being a satisfied customer, one who has enjoyed the fruits of collective bargaining. Look at the non-union plants, that, and there are many in the South. I'm not going to get into statistics of how, how little we're organized, but there's a reason for it. And I had occasion to, uh, to make a, a speech at the Georgia State University last weekend, and, and the governor was sitting alongside of me, and I just said it like I thought it was. That the business community and the politicians have systematically conspired to keep the worker in his place, be he white, black, or female. Keep them in their place. And, and I think it has been a systematically cons systematical conspiracy. I don't think there's, there's anything hidden about it. They don't want us to participate. They don't want us to enjoy getting into the political game. They don't want us having any of that power to, to be a citizen. That's what I want to talk to you a little bit about. Go to your meetings. Join your clubs, be a Republican or Democrat, and participate. Be proud of our special interest group. Be proud that you carry the name of union member. Because we are the only organization in this country, the only organization that has the worker at heart. And it disheartens me to hear our own people, you know, for some ungodly reason, saying, well, we should have gotten this, and we should have gotten this, and we should have gotten that. And if you were privileged to hear Jack Shankman yesterday, not only do we have to fight for our people in the area of collective bargaining, but in the halls of Congress. I'll give a figure. The International Ladies Garment Workers and the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, collectively between the two of them, have lost over 250,000 jobs in 10 years. They're going out of the country. And it's happening to the steel workers. And it's happening to the electronic industry. We have to do something about that. Those of us who live and work in this country and want to see it prosper, we have to get involved. We have to say apathy, no. Involvement, yes. Mr. Chairman, brothers and sisters, that's, that's the message I want to bring. Be involved. Be together. Do not let anybody, politician, would-be politician, malcontent, Destroy this beautiful thing we call the labor movement. It's ours. We're entrusted with it. We've enjoyed the benefits from it. And we should fight for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for those fine remarks. Right on the money as usual. The next order of business will be the nomination of officers, which will also be presided over by Jim South. Before I turn the gavel back over to Jim, for the benefit of those of you who haven't been to a convention before or participated in a, an election procedure in this organization, let me advise you that this is not a secret ballot election. Be very similar to the roll call vote we had yesterday. After the nominations are over, our secretary will prepare a written ballot, which will have the names of those candidates on it. This afternoon, when the election is held, the roll will be called. The delegate will come forward, get the ballot, You'll have the number of votes that you are allocated, allocated to you by your local union, and then you will mark on that ballot your, your designees for the board, for the other horses, et cetera. It's not a secret ballot election, 
I was asked here a couple of years ago about that, so people got a little bit disturbed because they discovered it wasn't secret ballot. Well, according to the rules of the organization, it's against those rules to have a secret ballot election. And the authority, the authority, if you want me to mention that to you, is the same document that I presented to uh, Harry uh, Adams here yesterday, the rules that govern the state and local central body. Okay? Brother Jim Solomon, I preside over the nomination of officers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a special order of business at 10 o'clock, I did finish right at 10. We will nominate President, Secretary Treasurer, five Vice Presidents, and 12 Board members. The floor is now open for nominations for the Office of President. Brother Wilson Evans. Mr. Chairman, fellow delegates, I would like to rise and place the name of, for the President of this organization. I would like to call him Mr. Labor, but in case we would call him that, people would think of Mr. Mean. So I will change and call him Mr. Forsyth. A lot of us have hindsight, but this particular gentleman have a foresight. I've known him since the early 60s or the late 50s. When I met him, I met him in Clarksdale, Mississippi. He was up there for the purpose of putting together a coalition of labor and minorities. At that time, labor, if some politician was running, he would ask that labor support him, but don't let anyone know that you support him. We used to have a day that we would invite, to have a banquet, we would invite politicians. We could all set them at one table because they didn't want to be seen with labor. Through the foresight of this man, he put together a coalition of labor, minorities, and now labor in the state of Mississippi is something great. All politicians seek the support of this organization. I would think that this man, through his leadership, was responsible for this. He also had the foresight to know that long as 40-some percent of the blacks in Mississippi was underpaid, there would never be the right pay for the other 60-some percent of the white brothers. He felt that Mississippi would never be able to take its rightful place in this nation until all people in the state of Mississippi had a right to vote. He went out of the state, secured funds and other means to register people. He did a tremendous job. And at this time, I would like to place in name and nomination the name of Mr. Claude Ramsey for the next president. Thank you, Brother Evans. The name of the incumbent president, Claude Ramsey, has been placed in nomination. Uh, I have had no guidance on this, but if anyone would like to second the nomination, I think that would be permissible. It's not necessary, but if they'd like to, it would be permissible. Are there any further nominations for the Office of President? Are there any further nominations for the Office of President? Are there any further nominations for the Office of President? Hearing none, I declare the nominations closed. is now open for the nomination of Secretary Treasurer. And the chair recognizes Brother John Morrow to place in name, in nomination of names. Mr. Chairman, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to nominate the first president of our local, a man who is dedicated to his work and who has done an outstanding job in labor. Mr. Uh, director, I nominate Brother Tom Knight. Brother Thomas Knight, the incumbent Secretary Treasurer, has been nominated. And we have three or four people here seconding the nomination. Are there any other nominations for the Office of Secretary Treasurer? 
Are there any further nominations for the Office of Secretary Treasurer? Are there any further nominations for the Office of Secretary Treasurer? Hearing none, I declare nominations closed. The floor will now be open for the nomination of five vice presidents. For the record, when the, nominee, when the nominator comes forward, would you state your name, please? The brother walking here. I'm Carol Turner, President of State Council Machines. I'd like to place the nomination of Russell Kelly for Vice President. The name of Russell Kelly has been placed in nomination. I'm C.E. Schaefer. Gives me a great deal of pleasure on behalf of the Mississippi Election Board to associate to place in nomination R.L. Tucker. The name of Harwell Tucker has been placed in nomination. I'm Amy Hollowell, ACTW Local 643 in Mark Valley. I want to nominate a man who has given some 30 years of his life to the labor movement. Uh, he is a member of the ACTW Local 563 in Hattiesburg. Uh, he is a member, I mean, he is the manager of the Mississippi Joint Board. He is also a vice president of the Mississippi Air <laughs> for some 10 years or so. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I nominate James Jackson for Vice President of the Mississippi FLCO. The name of James Jackson has been placed in nomination. The brother at the back, mic. I'm Thomas Andrews, President of the Columbus Central Labor Union. It gives me great pleasure to nominate Curtis Orman, who is the uh, incumbent Vice President of the State FLCO, and all of you know that he has done a good job. The name of Curtis Orman has been placed in nomination. Brother Wright. Mr. Chairman, Charlie Horn, IBW Local 2262, arise to place in nomination. A man that needs no introduction, a man that I've known for a long time, not always agreed with, was always able to work with. A man that, when I first became involved in the labor movement, who helped me get started in the right direction. A man that I know that have helped many other young trade unions to get involved, more involved in the trade union movement, to assist them with their union problems. A man that I feel that has been in the labor movement have played a major role and have dedicated a large portion of their young years to the ideals of the labor movement. A man that I've learned to respect, a man that I've learned to work with, a man that has played, as our folks stated, a major role in making the labor movement what it is today. I cannot forget about the time that the thing that the problem that I've gone to this gentleman with name that I want to place in nomination is Brother Bob Wilson, who is being decision of Local 3031, Vice President of the FLCO. I'd like to place the name of Brother Bob Wilson in nomination for Vice President. The name of Bob Wilson has been placed in nomination. I'd like to place the name of a man in nomination whose labor credentials are many. At the local level, starting at the local level, the advice and service has been a capacity of shop steward, secretary treasurer, and recently been re-elected to another term as vice president. He's also president of the North Delta Central Labor Council, president of North Central Mississippi Chapter of the April of Randolph Institute, currently serves on the Mississippi FLCL Executive Board, and also works full-time with the AFLCL Appalachian Council. I'm proud of it. The name of Cecil Shelton has been placed in nomination. Mr. Chairman, Ken Sproul, CBBA Local 199, Gulfport. I'd like to place the nomination for a man who's been uh, in union activity for 25 years, and uh, he's helped a whole lot of us on the coast to see labor as a better thing to get into. I'd like to place the nomination for Brother Harry Adams, CBBA Local 199. The name of Harry Adams has been placed in nomination. Are there any further nominations for the office of Vice President? 
Are there any further nominations for the office of Vice President? Are there any further nominations for the office of Vice President? Hearing none, I declare them closed. We do have seven candidates. And I think at this time it would be proper of the chair to ask if there are any declinations. Or do all the candidates will stand for office? If there are no declinations, then all seven candidates will stand for office. And the election, I believe, will take place at 3 o'clock this afternoon. The floor is now open for the nomination for board members. Twelve, of, twelve positions, I believe, for the office of board members. And if you'll just line up at the mic and state your name, and the name of the person that you're nominating. We'll start right here and we'll, we'll take turns from the front mic to the back mic. Point of order. What's the brother's point of order? How many board members did you say? I'm Joe Davis, Delegate. Twelve? Yeah. I'm sorry, I stand corrected. Ten? Not only stand corrected, but I should go back and read your Constitution. Thank you, brother, for the point of order. Ten board members. By the way. I rise to place a nomination in the name of a carpenter. Being a carpenter myself, my name is Marvin Taylor, local 387, Columbus, Mississippi. I'm placing a nomination for executive board member, a carpenter that is a member of local 1667, Biloxi, since 1960. He's held various offices in the local since 1963. Took office as financial secretary and business representative in 1974 has held various offices in the South Mississippi Carpenters District Council since 1963 and is currently president of the District Council and is, has held the office of Secretary Treasurer of the Mississippi State Council of Carpenters since 1975. I would take great pleasure in placing in nomination Richard Grady as Executive Board Member of the Mississippi AFL-CIO. Thank you. The name of Richard Grady has been placed in nomination. The brother on the back, mic, please. Mr. Chairman, Jay Richardson, CWA Local 10511, Jackson, Mississippi. I'd like to place in the nomination the name of a current board member. Everybody knows her. She's been there a good while. She's done a good job. I'd like to place in the nomination the name of Mary I. Bryant. Ms. Mary Bryant's name has been placed in nomination. Brothers in front line. Mr. Chairman, Lewis Carter, IBEW Local 2198. I would like to place in nomination for executive board member and IBEW member since 1963 as served as executive board member and president of Local 1028, elected business manager in 1971, and re-elected each time since, served as president of the Tupelo Central Labor Union, presently serving as chairman of the Mississippi Association of Central Labor Unions, Secretary Treasurer, Mississippi Electrical Workers, and President Serving as Executive Board Member, Mississippi AFL CIO. Mr. Chairman, I nominate Brother Joseph Davis. Brother Joseph Davis, his name has been placed in nomination. Brother on the back, Mike. My name is James Monday. I work for Local 469. I'd like to place Brother Lewis Turner, his name is nomination for election for the executive board. Brother Lewis Turner's name has been placed in nomination. Brother, sister, the front line. Sorry. My name is Lena Barrett, and it gives me great pleasure to nominate Mary Ellen Williams. She has been a member of IBW since uh, 2262 since 1970, financial secretary of local union since 1974 time. 
Hearing none, I declare nominations closed. According to my count, there was more than 10, so I'll ask if there are any declinations at this time for the Office of Board Member. Hearing none, all of the members nominated will stand for election. At this time, I'd like to turn the chair back over to the incumbent president and the unopposed candidate for the presidency, Brother Claude Ransom. say before we begin to get back on the Greg Lord business side, people appreciate the fact that you've seen fit to <clears throat> return me to this office without opposition. I will attempt to have a few words to say before the convention is over with. <clears throat> Uh, brother Solid just mentioned something to me that uh, he forgot to appoint a committee. He felt like it's my job and he's correct on that. It is, it is my job and I named that committee yesterday to conduct the roll call uh, vote. Uh, brother Wood is the chairman of that committee. Let me see if I can find it. Brother Fitzhugh? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to request that uh, since there's been some confusion in the past elections that uh, the, someone explain the Constitution and see if there's any uh, vice presidents or executive board members that would be running against each other since in the past there's been confusion that uh, one member that may have got the most votes couldn't serve because of the limitations provided for in the Constitution. I think this should be explained uh, before we go into the voting procedure, wherever Doug will know what they're doing. Okay. I assume what you're talking about is that under the Constitution and bylaws of the organization, no two vice presidents can come from the same Central Labor Council area or the same international union. That applies only to vice presidents. Now, also, there's a prohibition over any over three uh, members of the general board being from the same international union. I don't think we have a conflict there, Brother Fitz, that you, um, you got R. A. Kelly from Pascagoula, Tucker from Meridian, James Jackson from Hattiesburg, Curtis, Curtis Orman from West Point, Robert Woodson from Jackson, Cecil Sheldon from <coughs> Grenada, and Harry Adams from Gulfport. Uh, I don't think there's any two of those people from the same central labor body area, nor <coughs> the same international union, so I don't uh, see any conflict there. Uh, the, <coughs> the, uh, we could go down the list, I guess, and see. I don't think we have any problem with the board members. Uh, in other words, you got, uh, let me check it out just off from there, you got Tucker, Vice President, IBEW, Joe Davis, IBEW, uh, Marynell Whips, IBEW, that's three, there's no, they're, they're, they're entitled to three, at least they can have a maximum of three. We don't have any conflict that I can see in that regard. Huh? Mr. Chairman, my Constitution reads on page 11, section 3, no more than two members at large of the executive board should be members of the same national and international union. Have, you got a, have we got a violation of that? No. Yeah. Huh? Well, yeah, I agree. He has to, they have to be elected first, but uh, you can't for, for, prohibit people from from nominating people. Now, if they want to nominate, we have the election. The only way I see to deal with that is we, if we wind up with more than the allocated number from a particular international union, 
We'll, we'll have to deal with that when we get to it. I don't know. We just can't prevent people from nominating people. You know. All right, we're going to get back on the regular order of business. The next speaker is also an old friend. Spent a lot of time with us in Mississippi. Was she had during a real tough period. Had you on the floor? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there, I'm sure there's no delegates here that would vote for me, but there may be some that would like to vote against me. Would you make a correction as to who you gave that pamphlet to yesterday? It was not Harry Adams, it was me. Yeah. And if somebody's got me confused with him, you know, a vote, a vote against, against him wouldn't hurt me too much, you know. <laughs> I stand corrected. That's not the... That's not the Harry Adams was nominated there, obviously. I, uh, I think, Brother Solomon, we should have had those people that were nominated to stand be recognized when they were nominated. And since <clears throat> that wasn't done, I'm going to pause a minute and do it myself. Is Russell Kelly in the building? Russell is a vice president. You all know Russell. He's been around a long time. He probably might have had to go down to the thing in Gulfport for that hot campaign they got going. Oil Tucker, is he in the building? There he is. James Jackson, over here. Let him see you. Curtis Orman, back there. <coughs> Robert Woodson, back there. Cecil Shelton, over here. Harry Adams. Where'd Harry at? That Harry Adams go. Harry, let him see you. You've been nominated for vice president. There he is, right there, walking in the door. That's Harry Allen. All right. Board members, Richard Grady. Where's Richard? Richard Grady back in the corner back there. Mary Bryant. Back over there. Joe Davis in the back. Lois <laughs> Turner. Over here. Marinelle Whips up here. Herbert Williams right there. Ronnie Bell over here. James Cater back in the corner. Devil Herring over here. Ralph Miley. Back in the back. Ian e. Grantham, over here. Tom Andrews, back in the back. And Mary Tucker. Where's Mary? There we are. Now you've seen all of the nominees. Now I was about to introduce our old friend Dan Powell. I noticed he brought his wife with him to this convention. I guess she probably got tired of him coming to Mississippi right chicks out to Claude Ramsey, and she <laughs> come along to prevent that from happening again. Now, I'm not, somebody wants to talk to me in private about what I was talking about, I'll explain the situation to you. But Dan's been with us a long time. He's been a great help to this organization. <clears throat> and I thank Dan that it'd be safe to say, since you first came to Mississippi, there's been a tremendous growth in this organization. It's my pleasure now to present to you the co-director, here co-director Dan Powell. Powell. Thank you, Claude. <coughs> Let me say that you are indeed fortunate in having two men like Claude Ramsey 
Dean Tom Knight. I wish that we had a Claude Rams and a Tom Knight in every state in the South. If we did, we'd be much further ahead than we are today. Not only is Claude one of the top labor leaders in this country, but he's also one of the best gin rummy players in the South, and that's what he was referring to about those checks. <laughs> Last time I was down here, we sat in a hotel room, and he smoked one cigarette after another and created so much smoke in that room that I couldn't even see the cards. And won $60 uh, from me by that unfair tactic. <laughs> Yesterday, as I sat here and watched your roll call vote, as I saw the two representatives of the governor outside the hall here, buttonholing delegates, as I noticed on the hotel directory the listing of the governor's hospitality room, as I saw all this effort being brought to bear upon the endorsement of this convention, my mind went back to 1967. When we went to see Bill Wano about endorsing him for governor, and Wano told us in no uncertain language that he didn't want our endorsement, he'd take our money, and on the side he'd take our support, provided we didn't let anybody know that we were supporting him. Frustrated by Bill Wano, that same year, we talked to Bill Waller, who was making his first race for governor. And Mr. Waller was kinder. He told us he would take our endorsement if we contribute $50,000 to his campaign. And yesterday, the governor of this state fought to, present, to, to prevent you from endorsing his opponent, how times have changed. <laughs> and that change in times is a tribute to you and to the officers and to the labor movement that you're building in the state of Mississippi. Now this morning, I want to talk to you about politics but in order to talk about politics, I first have to talk a little bit about unions. Several centuries ago, a man or a group of men discovered that workers acting as a unit could enforce their demands on their employers, could increase their wages, could better their working conditions. And it was with this concept that the trade union movement was born. The central theme of organized labor, the essence of unions, have been unity, unity. Thousands of workers acting with the will and the heart of one. And wherever the history of the trade union movement, we have been able to achieve unity. Success has followed. In fact, our success has always been in direct ratio to the degree of unity that we are able to achieve among the rank and file. Wherever we failed, it was not because of the efforts of the bosses or management. Wherever we failed, it was because we failed to achieve unity in our ranks. Unity is our greatest asset, internal division, our greatest liability, and our greatest enemy. But more than 150 years ago, 
the labor movement came to realize that success at the bargaining table was not enough. We came to see that all we could achieve at the bargaining table <coughs> could be taken away by one decision of the court, one act of the legislature or federal Congress, or one stroke of the pen by a governor or a president of the United States. We saw in the Antitrust Act of the late 90s that labor could be legislated out of existence. We saw that wage increases could be wiped out by price increases. We saw that workers had many needs which could not be resolved or met at the bargaining table, that there were benefits that could be obtained only through legislation and government, such as better schools, better educational opportunities, lower city and federal taxes, full employment, control of inflation, lower utility bills, and that should be a problem to many of you, those utility bills now have passed what you're paying on your monthly note on the house. And finally, the protection of our jobs against the big multinational corporations taking work out of this country to foreign shores. All of these things, all of these needs, must and can only be obtained through legislation which is the result of political action. But through the years of politics, we have not been able to achieve the same degree of success as we've been able to get through collective bargaining. Because in politics, we've allowed ourselves to be divided. Division in politics was so bad among the old knights of labor in the latter part of the last century that when the American Federation of Labor was formed in 1883, they decided that they were going to avoid the division of politics and were not going to have a political program, but instead they were going to lobby the Federal Congress and the state legislatures. And they put their best men in Washington and in the state capitals. And for 17 years they lobbied. And for 17 years their lobbying effort was a miserable failure. And by the turn of the century, labor in this country was worse off in terms of restrictive legislation in terms of anti-labor laws, in terms of court decisions, than it had been 17 years before when the AFL was founded. So they took stock, and they saw they had to go back into politics. And at the turn of the century, the American Federation of Labor moved back into politics. And we've been there brief exceptions ever since. Today, the enlightened labor leaders in America understand and know that the future of organized labor in this country, our ability to maintain our unions, depends on our success or failure in politics. Here in Mississippi, the AFL-CIO has a tremendous potential in politics. The AFL-CIO is the largest economic political organization in the state of Mississippi. You have more members than the combined membership 
of the Farm Bureau, the Mississippi Economic Council, all the state and city chambers of commerce, and all the, uh, the associated industries combined, you have more membership. Now, in your kits, you got a scratch pad, and you got a pen, a ballpoint pen. I want you to get them out now. I want to give you some figures that are very, very important to you. I want to give you a look at the profile, the political profile of Mississippi. Now, you don't have to write down these. I'll tell you when to begin writing. You have a population in the state today of 2,216,912. Of which blue collars and service workers constitute 60% of the population. Farm workers, 6%, and white collar workers, 39%. You have a black population of 37% or about 820,000, of which 534,000 of that black, black population is the voting age. You have a total voting age population in the state of about 1,500,000. You have approximately a little better than a million rich to vote, of which about 350,000 are black. The median age of the voter in Mississippi is 43 years old. If all those in the state of Mississippi today were registered to vote, and actually, I mean, all those that were registered to vote actually went to the polls and voted, and a candidate in a two-way race would need 501, 500,001 votes to win. The biggest vote that's ever been cast in Mississippi came in the 1976 presidential election when Carter got 381,329 votes, 51 percent, against 366,846 before. A total vote was cast in the presidential race of 748,175. To win, Carter would have needed, and he got a few more than he needed, he would have needed 374,000 votes. Now I want you to start writing. Labor's pot political potential in Mississippi. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are approximately 76,000, 76,000 AFL CIO members in the state of Mississippi. Now, most of those members are married, having wives or husbands. I would say that the number of that are married probably approach 90%. But to be conservative, let's say that only 80% of our membership are married. That means that you've got another 60,800 wives and husbands. Our total membership of wives and husbands of 136,800. Now, that's not all you can there's not a single one of those 76,000 half of our CIO members in the state of Mississippi that's so unpopular, that's so ornery, that he could not influence at least two votes among his relatives, his neighbors, or his friends. If he tried, he could influence two people besides himself and his wife to vote for Labor-supported candidate. If he did that, we would have another 152,000 votes. In other words, if of LCO members, wives and husbands, friends, relatives and neighbors, 
constitute a labor potential vote in this state of 288,800. That's not all. You could win almost any election that's held in the state of Mississippi if you put 288,000 votes behind the candidate that you endorsed. No other organization in the state could approach that. But you've still got additional power, additional potential. And that is through an alliance with the black vote in the state. Subtracting the AFL-CIO blacks from the total number of blacks registered to vote leaves about 318,824 blacks who are not members of the AFL-CIO. If you combine the black vote in Mississippi with the labor and the labor influence vote, you have a total vote of 607,624, which is a little better than 60% of the total registration in the state. So you see the potential power that exists here in Mississippi for organized labor and for blacks. But potential is not actual present, uh, actual present power. We have not reached our potential for three major reasons. First, members, wives, husbands, 136,000 of them, only about 60% registered which means that instead of a potential of 136,000, we only have 81,600 registered voters today, probably a smaller percent of relatives, friends, and neighbors are registered than are registered among actual union members and their families. The second reason that we have not reached our potential it is internal division within the ranks of labor brought forth by the action of the bosses and the politicians. How many times in the plan have you heard when you were trying to collect Coke dollars? I'm not going to let Coke tell me how to vote. <laughs> how many times have you heard that? Huh? Anybody hadn't heard it? Do you think that that thought was original with the person who said it? Of course the hell it wasn't. The foreman had put it in his mind. The foreman had talked to him. He said, look, you're not going to let those labor bosses and that coke tell you how to vote, are you? And the poor fool reacted to it that way. I remember back during the dark days of Mississippi in the 60s, when you couldn't collect Coke dollars in Mississippi because the white workers were told that if they contributed to Coke, they were told this for the foreman in the plants, if you contributed to Coke, your Coke money was going to the NAACP and to SNCC. And in the plants where the workers were black, they were told, don't you give to cope, your dollars are going to the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council. They played both sides of the street very successfully. And we didn't know what was going on. As bad as the division has been by the management, it has been far worse for the politicians. You know, I've been around long enough, 33 years on this job, to know most of the political tricks which the politicians use to divide us. I've 
same candidates for governor for the United States Senate go around to town after town seeking out the union leaders, saying to them with the greatest of flattery, John, you're the best union leader in this state. And after flattering him, saying, John, I know you've got a problem at home. You've got a brother-in-law who drinks, and he can't keep a job. He's a financial drain on you. And if you'll support me for governor and I get elected, or if you support me for the United States and I get elected, I'll get that brother-in-law a job and get him out of your house. All he'll say to him, look, you support me and I'll let you name the patronage that people receive in this county. Or you support me and I'll do this and I'll do that for you. And our people are flattered that they're getting this attention and they buy it. They don't stop to think that any politician that can buy you as an individual away from the labor movement has no respect for you. It's like the story of the fellow that asked the girl. <coughs> He says, honey, would you spend the night with me for a thousand dollars? She says, of course I would. He says, would you spend the night with me for a dollar? She slapped his face. He says, what's wrong? She says, what do you think I am? He says, we've already established that. We're just trying to settle on price. <laughs> <coughs> And when a politician comes to you and tries to buy you, and you accept, he knows what you are. I remember the case in Tennessee. Every time that he ran, we supported Estes Kefo for the United States Senate. And in his last race, he was worried. He came back to Tennessee early, and he was over in Knoxville. And he was talking to Lucille Thornburg, who was active in politics and in coke over there. And he says, Lucille says, I want you to set up some meetings for me among the labor people as soon as possible. Lucille says, Senator, says, we've always supported you, and says, I expect we're going to support you again. But, Senator, I'm not going to set up any meetings for you until you've been endorsed for the Tennessee Labor Council. Estes Kefal, great man that he was, was so impressed by this woman's loyalty to the labor movement and her refusal to even let him influence her before the labor movement had acted. Told that story all over the state. He had respect for Lucille Thornburg because she was a part of the labor movement and she made the decisions on the basis of what the labor movement did. A second reason, that, a third reason that we have not developed our potential is that we have not learned how to develop a block vote. Let me ask you a question. And I want you to answer it by a show of hands. Regardless of who COPE endorses, should union members vote their own convictions and for the candidate of his or her choice? regardless of the endorsement of coal. Let me see the hands of all of you who think that each member should vote his own individual choices and convictions. Let's see your hands. All should union members block vote for the candidate endorsed by coal. 
Let's see the hands of those of you that think we should block voting. There'll be a lot of you that are not undecided, that are still undecided. Get those pencils out again now. I want to give you some. Mathematics, the mathematics of a divided vote, and the mathematics of a block vote. For this example, let us assume that we have a hundred thousand AFL CIO members, wives and husbands, who are registered to vote and are going to vote in the coming U.S. senatorial primary. Let's also assume that we are badly divided in the Senate race, and each member votes his own convictions. And the Koch endorsed candidate gets a majority of one vote. If 100,000 members voted, the Koch candidate gets a majority of just one vote. That would mean that the Koch candidate would get 50,001 votes, wouldn't it? Huh? If 100,000 voted, it means that his opponent would get 49,999 votes, wouldn't it? Huh? Yeah. What is the value of your endorsement when you split yourselves? Like that. Huh? All right, subtract your, from uh, 50,001 votes, subtract 49,999. And you see the value of an endorsement of 100,000, an authorization of 100,000 members who split themselves, who divide, <coughs> who vote their own convictions regardless of what their union does. The value of their endorsement is just two votes. But consider, if you will, another organization who has a good sense to follow its leadership. An organization not of 100,000 members, not of 50,000, not of 1,000, not even of 100 members, but an organization of only 10 members. They endorse a candidate. They get a 90% vote for that candidate. How many votes does he get? Huh? He gets nine, doesn't he? <coughs> How many votes does the opposing candidate get? One. Subtract one from nine, what do you get? Eight. So an organization of only 10 members. Voting is a block. Has four times the political power of an organization of 100,000 members dividing themselves. <coughs> Think about that. Take it home. <coughs> Go to the next union meeting. Talk about the mathematics of a divided vote and the mathematics of a united block vote. Yesterday, in this hall, by a per capita vote of 17,840, you endorsed Danton to the United States Senate against a no endorsement vote of 17,825. In other words, you endorsed Danton by 70% of the vote. Seventy percent. You would think that's enough of a majority to get unity, wouldn't you? When Danton ran for governor in 1975, he did not make the second primary. He did not have you endorsed. If you do your job, the job that you are capable of doing, you can put Danton in the runoff. And if Danton gets in the runoff, you, the AFL-CIO, and you individual leaders throughout this state 
will get the credit for Danton being in the runoff. And if you put Danton in the runoff, in my opinion, you can elect him to the United States Senate. Now, why do I say that? Historically, in Mississippi, <clears throat> the favorite in the first primary, in this case, Mr. Finch, or Governor Finch, the favorite in the first primary must get a majority of votes in that primary. If he is forced into a runoff, he generally loses in Mississippi. Go back to 1967. Bill Warner was a favorite in the first primary. He was forced into a second primary with John Bell Williams and was defeated. Four years later, Charlie Sullivan Running against Bill Waller, Sullivan had made three or four excellent state races. And Charlie Sullivan was a favorite. But he couldn't muster that majority vote in the first primary and was forced into a second primary and lost. You go back just three years ago. When one or again running for governor was the overwhelming favorite in the first primary. <coughs> but he couldn't get his majority in the first primary and Finch defeated him in the runoff. So you see, there's ample precedent for what I'm saying. Finch, to be elected to the United States Senate, has got to win in the first primary. If he's forced into a runoff, the man that's in the runoff with him, in my opinion, will be elected to the Senate. Now, in conclusion, let me say this to you. You have an opportunity before you today, such as you've never had before in the state of Mississippi, to demonstrate your political power and to make labor stronger, both politically and economically, than it's ever been in this state before. Or, likewise, you have the opportunity to say to the politicians, we are divided among ourselves. Our leadership is gone its own way individually. It has not acted united. If you go back home and you say, we made a decision in Jackson. And for the good of the labor movement, we are going to carry out that decision. We are going to support that for the United States Senate, come hell or high water. If you do that, you're going to win. As a final word, let me tell you a story. Something else that happened in Tennessee in 1962. We had a governor's race. Labor was supporting a former bricklayer who was mayor of Chattanooga by the name of Rudy Ojati for governor. We could not get the black endorsement for Ojati, despite the fact that Esther Keefauver was supporting him. The blacks had endorsed Frank Clement, thinking that he was the best candidate. As the campaign wore on, it was revealed that Clement, Clement's actions in behalf of maintaining segregation in the state in the early 50s came to light. Senator Estes Kefauver, about two weeks before the election, Kefauver, along with Label, was supporting Ojati. He met with the black leaders in West Tennessee, up in Dyersburg. And he said to them, he said, look, you're behind the wrong man. Change your endorsement. Support Ojadi and we can elect him governor. By this time, some of the black leaders realized that they'd probably made a mistake in the endorsement. But they told the senator, they said, Senator, you've been our friend. We love you, we believe you, we follow you through hell. But now it's two weeks before the election. It's too late to change our endorsement. And Senator, it's better. In terms of the future of the blacks of Tennessee, 
that we go down to defeat united behind a bad candidate than we divide ourselves between two good candidates. I've often remembered those words. It is better that labor be united behind a bad candidate in terms of the future of labor than it is to be divided among two good candidates. Again, essence is the heart. Unity is the essence and the heart of the trade union movement. I hope on election day that you will practice that unity and become the power of Mississippi politics that you can be. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Powell, for such an excellent job. delegates from Columbus area meet in room 2077 right after lunch. All delegates from Columbus area? Okay. Our next speaker is no stranger to Mississippi. She spent a lot of time here in our state over a long period of time. Many of you know her personally. She's been in your community. I first met Fanny. She was on the Cope staff in 1965. After the Voting Rights Act was passed, we, in conjunction with some other people, initiated an intensive voter restoration campaign in Mississippi. In addition to that, we also set up a series of voter education workshops in various areas of our state. And Fannie Neal was always with us, and she probably has more knowledge of Mississippi than some of you have, because she's been there, believe you me. Now, she's been elevated to a high sounding position. Uh, VIP, I believe they call her now. Uh, she is now what used to be the Women's Activity Director. Recently took over those duties. And with those few remarks, it's my pleasure to present to you our friend, Fanny Neal. Thank you very much, President Ramsey. To the delegates, fellow trade unionists, brothers and sisters, it is indeed a great pleasure to me to have the opportunity to be with you at your ninth convention and to share this platform. It is really wonderful to see democracy in action. It really is. First, I'd like to congratulate our president, Brother Ramsey, and our secretary treasurer, Tom Knight, for having been elected re-elected without opposition this morning. I hope that the entire board can go back because I think they've done a good job. I was going to tell you a little bit about Claude Ramsey and my early experiences in Mississippi after he took over the um, leadership. I want to tell you first of all when I came into Mississippi to, uh, in it, to do any work or anything when I was on the staff, I slipped in and I slipped out because it was not uh, wise to let our labor leaders know that black people was in the state telling black folks about getting registered to vote. So we've come a very long way. In 1960s, the mid-60s after the Voting Rights Act, Earl Davis, who recently retired, and God bless him, and I was sent into the state along with Horace Sheffield from UAW and many other people, but the three of us were so, sort of a team. And we worked with a delightful man by the name of Reverend Allen Johnson. And I tell you, we got a chance to travel all over the state, up every peaked trail, 
up every dirt road and, and everywhere in this state. There's no place Alan Johnson doesn't know. But I want to tell you that there was no place that we went and Claude Ramsey knew that we were going, we were going there that Claude didn't get in his car and ride behind us three or four hundred feet with his shotgun on the front seat because it was still not safe for us to come into the state to talk about getting black people to register and participate in the political arena of our lives in this state. So we have a lot, as you sit and hear things, uh, talk going on and everything, I think we need to just look back a little bit and let us think how far we have come and analyze our thoughts and our minds and see what we have to lose if we are mighty careful. Now, on Tom Knight. Tom Knight and I have known each other for more years than he will admit, and I know I dare not admit. Tom Knight and I came from the same union. At that time, it was the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. Tom was from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, or Laurel, and I was from Montgomery, Alabama. And I want to tell you all something. Amalgamated had been trying to organize the Reliance Manufacturing Company for many years. And they had lost the elections, this place and that place. And then they came to Montgomery, Alabama, and they talked, about, talked to about five frustrated young blacks who was working in that shop. Those of us who were so frustrated didn't have the serious problems that the other members of other people, employees, had. But it was terribly frustrating to see men and women treated like, well, I shouldn't say dogs, but treated inhuman, talked to like they were not human beings. And this really created problems. I was fortunate enough because of the wall to get a job that was formerly known as a white man's job, that of the marker in the plant. And I'll have to tell you something, when you get a job that's not easy to learn to do, you learn it if you possibly can and learn it quickly and then you be efficient on it and then you always be on time and be at work. And then you don't teach nobody else how to do the job because you can make yourself a little bit needed so this is the game that I played when I got to be the marker. Tom was a marker in his shop down in Hattiesburg. And so our association goes back to the 1940s. And you can see that that's been a long time ago. Since that time, there are many things, many, a lot of water has run down the stream. I looked out here a few minutes ago while I saw him last night. Very dear friend of mine from up in the Tri-Cities of Alabama, Paul Johnson. And Paul and I have known each other for more years than we're going to tell. But Paul and I had an opportunity to serve together on the executive board of the Alabama Labor Council in Alabama. And I was elected to this board in 1948, and at the merger, Paul was also elected. So we have a long history. As I look around, I look back. I can't help but look back and think about how far we have come. Paul told me last night he's the coordinator now for the uh, Tom Big B project that's going on here in the state of Mississippi on through Tennessee and Alabama. So uh, we have made some progress through the years. I certainly don't want to stand here and, and reminisce too long, but I felt that uh, as I heard Dan Paul talk this morning and talk about Estes Key Falfa and the position that the black people in, Mrs. in Tennessee took back in 1960, I could not help but still be proud to know that once there was a time when we had black leaders whom we had respect for and whom we followed, right or wrong, we followed this leadership. Now, we were together on everybody except Ojai. And uh, as I have 
heard many statements made here about your coming elections. I too am one who cannot forget things that have happened. There may be pressure on me pretty soon to support somebody that, that's going to make me hold my breath and I might just ask for an assignment in another state instead of working in Alabama. But there are some people that I shall never forgive for having taken the positions that they took where we were concerned as human beings, as taxpayers, and as citizens of this great country, the country that we love and the country that we have been loyal to. I'm here today to talk about the COPE program, the goals, I'd like to talk about the goals of the AF of LCIO COPE program. These goals can only be reached or can be accomplished if each local union officer, each local union board member, each local union member, each local union member take an active part in trying to develop a team that has meant so much to us, that of the labor movement, and to work for the program to be successful, we have to have guidelines. The COPE program is no secret to most of you. You've heard the name COPE. Last night a few people was telling me, we've always given $2 to COPE, but we've never done anything besides that. And this was, it was really a stimulating conversation because it showed that there are members who, if they are urged to do more, will do it. But we're going to have to try to develop our leadership and make them have a little bit more imagination about where we want to go and what is it that we really want to attain. Do we want to protect these rights? Do we want to protect the gains that we have made through the labor movement? Or do we want to sit idly by and let a pat on the back or a compliment or an unfulfilled or unfulfilling promise to us of what will be done, get our minds off of where we want to go and trying to reach the goals that the AFL-CIO has fought for for us through these years. We have a great responsibility of informing our members, and I think that this is part of what we have been about at this convention. Tom told you, I mean, Claude told you a little while ago, when he first met me, I was on the staff of the National AF of LCIO. But I told you that before that time, I had done other things in the union. My responsibilities prior to May of 1977, was to work throughout the country, working with black people, trying to organize them, trying to get them to organize politically, to register, to keep them informed and to let them know what the issues were really about and to try to get them to uh, help build a coalition between the labor movement and the black community. Because all of us who are black and all of us who are in the labor movement know that what is good for labor certainly is good for blacks. The minimum wage, to mention just one. Health care. I could just stand here and talk about the many things that the AFL-CIO, our organized labor, has done for the people of this country that we as blacks have been the big beneficiaries of. Last year, in May, the department was reorganized, COPE department was reorganized. The minority staff was absorbed into the regular stream of the staff of the Air Force LCIO. I was made the volunteer and politics director for 10 southern states, including Texas. So if you have not seen a lot of me, it's because if I go to Texas, it would take all of my time trying to do the job in Texas. But I have 10 other states, and we are working hard to try to make it real. 
The VIP program is not a separate organization from the regular COPE program. It is a subcommittee. In VI, in, in, with me, the VIPs are the most important part of any of the COPE program because we are the ones that get on and, and do the nitty gritty work. We make the preparations for our memberships to be updated. We make the preparations to know where our members are. We are the ones that does the work, the ground root, the grassroots work. Now, for the benefit of you who do not know what the volunteers in politics is about, Tom, uh, Claude told you a few minutes ago that uh, the name was changed, and it was changed during the reorganization of our staff. The reason that it was changed was because we have so many men working in the program in some parts of the country, and it was unfair to refer to these fine union men as women activity workers. So they decided to change the name to Volunteers in Politics. Some of the women said they were happy that they changed the name because they was tired of being referred to as women after dark. Now, let me talk a little bit about what the program is about. Number one, we want to achieve full participation of our union members and of their families in the development and the activities of the national, the state, the county, and the local union level of COPE. Now, how do we do this? Number one, we must encourage VIP members and their families to register and to vote. We set up telephone banks. We check registration status of all our members. We do distribution of literature. We set up carpools to help register people and to get them out to vote. We sponsor conferences for political education. We sponsor conferences to teach our volunteers what the VIP program consists of and how we really uh, handle the computer cards and the computer printouts. We do whatever services is necessary to build the union and to build the co-programs throughout our country. As far as the rules and the procedures, we at VIP, at VIP are completely under the directions of National Code. The VIPs in your state will work under the directions of your state code, your county code, and your central labor council code. We set up work rooms where the VIPs work on all phases of the program. Now, let's talk a little bit about how we develop a VIP program and how we recruit volunteers. Number one, we know that the heart of the VIP program is our volunteers. And without them, we'll have no program. And many places you go, people say, I can't get volunteers, I can't. My mother taught me as a little child there was no such thing as I can't. And it has stayed with me because I, I believe that it can be done. Now, who are the volunteers? They are people of all ages who are interested in the labor movement's programs and in social legislation that we want and we need and social legislation that we have that is in danger. These are the volunteers. When are they needed? They are needed now. They were needed last year. But we have to have a beginning. We need them now to help us in Mississippi. We need them now to help us get our mailing list updated. Because I'm telling you one thing about union people. We started making a little better salaries and we start moving to little better neighborhoods and as soon as we can, we move again. Somebody told me not to tell that anymore, said because there's some labor people who move every time rent is due. And that's why we're having such a hard time in trying to keep up with 
But it's no way that your state organization can get, send you mail unless we have a correct address. And now, when we send a letter out, when I say we, I'm talking about anybody. If you send a letter out and you want to return on it and it's not delivered, you pay 25 cents to get that letter back. And you think about our organization sending out 50 or 60 or 70,000 letters, and if 20% came back, how many letters that would be at 25 cents? So it's very important that we have these volunteers to assist in getting our mailing list updated so that we can keep in touch. It's always also important that we get the telephone numbers, because how can we call people? We don't know where that where they are, what their phone numbers are. Then another thing we want to talk about is how do we get volunteers? The only way I know to get them is just ask them. And it's no, you can send out letters and you can do a lot of telephone calling. I know because when posters call me and want to know something, it depends on how I feel or what I'm doing, and I'll agree with them or I'll disagree. But if I don't want to be bothered, I say, okay, yes, you know, and I get rid of them. But it's no better way and it's no easier way to recruit true volunteers and to just walk up to people and ask them if they will give a little bit of their time to help us build a program that's going to help us maintain the gains that we have made. There's no point in us depending on somebody promising us and that, that they're going to come at 4 o'clock on Thursday and thinking that they're going to remember because Wednesday night, the last thing you do is you better contact them and let them know you'll be expecting them on Thursday at 4. But once they get into the swing of the program and see how vitally important the program is and how badly they are needed, I have found that we are really developing. Now, how do we keep volunteers? We keep them busy. We compliment them. We praise them for the work that they do. You know, we're so hung up on who's going to get the credit for something. And I don't know why it matters who gets the credit so much. If the work is done and the end results are, are gained, I think that's the most important thing. But since we are aware that we're all human beings and that everybody likes a little bit of credit, then we try to give credit to the people who help us build our programs. We in Arkansas, just on the 15th of last month, we gave awards, and there were some 50 people who received awards for volunteer hours. Two people, Ardell, Ardell Baird and Hazel Neely, had over 5,000 hours, and they got a diamond, a little pin with a diamond in it. There were about four people who got gold watches for 4,000 hours, and they go on down. But after you have given 100 hours, then we do give special recognition to you. Had we had the program prior to this year in Mississippi with the new setup, we would have tried to arrange, for those of you who have given service over a period of years to the uh, WAD program to have received awards this morning. But since we have been busy in other areas, we did not contact Brother Ramsey and Sister Hollowell to try to get this done at this convention. But I promise you that at your next convention, the volunteers in politics will have special recognition and you will be proud to know what we have done. Um, I uh, could stand here and tell you a whole lot of things, other things about the program, but I know that you're anxious to get on with your convention and you have a lot of business to take, take care of, you've got a lot of politicking to do, and since that's what we are about politics, whether it's in the union or outside the union, I think that I should sit down and let you get about your business. It's been a joy to be here with you this morning, and I will not sit down until I have asked each of you in your local unions, if you don't have a co-committee, whether you're in office or not, the next meeting when they call for business, new business or old business, let's talk about, let's set up a co-committee. And you appoint people from your union, ask for volunteers, because a volunteer is a better person than a person who's just appointed by somebody. Okay? So don't be sitting back waiting just for that person that you 
uh, appoint to work. I think that you ought to ask for volunteers and explain to them how important this program is. If we are going to be successful, and if we're going to have representation in Washington to help maintain the programs that Mississippi has received from our federal government, then we better get ourselves registered and we better vote and we better vote to send somebody there who believe in the same things, the ideals of the labor movement. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. I hope you can stay around for the remainder of the convention. Would the sergeant at arms <clears throat> step outside and see if Sarah Broom is ready to go with her part of the program here? Is she here? She's in the building. She's here already. Before I get Sarah up here to do her thing, we got a couple of visitors that have checked in with us since uh, I last introduced. Uh, recognized uh, guest, Mr. Ralph Gurley, the sub-district director of the Steelworkers Union of uh, Birmingham. Mr. Gurley, stand up and let him see you. Happy to have you here. Amos Hood, Steelworker representative. We don't need much introduction to a lot of you. Amos, we're happy you made it. Robert L. Comio with the Retail Clutch Union over here. He'll be speaking to you tomorrow about the Lynn Dixie situation. At this time, I'm going to present to you our good friend Sarah Broom, been with us on numerous occasions in the past. She is primarily responsible for the union labor program of the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. Sarah will well, I'm sure I'll have a few words she'd like to say, and then perhaps he's going to have a drawing or a couple of prizes you'd like to give away. So at this time, it's my pleasure to present to you our friend Sarah Broom. Sarah? Thank you, President Ramsey, officers, and fellow union members. You don't know how happy I am to have the opportunity to come back down to Mississippi and see all my good friends again. But I'm sorry to say that a lot of you didn't come in here with a union label, which you know breaks my heart. I am the coordinator for the J.P. Stevens uh, campaign in the South. I'm not going to say, but a very few words on it, you know, you can go into the stores and talk to the merchants, the owner or the president, and ask him if he will discontinue the sale of the sheets and pillowcases and so forth that are manufactured by the J.P. Stevens Company until such time as we can get this settled. I know many of you have been doing it, and I know many of you will continue. You'll be surprised at the merchants who are in sympathy with us the merchants who do not want to uh, be classed with the number one lawbreaker. It's just one thing I'd like to tell you and then I'm going to tell you something else that really breaks my heart. I was at the stockholder meeting in Greenville, South Carolina. And one of the people, one of the uh, people who owned stock got up and asked the president, Mr. President, is it true that you will retire on $96,000 a year when you retire? And he said, yes. Why don't you get such as that for your employees? They get up to $20 a month. And he said that with that Social Security made a neat little package. Many of you who have seen that film, you saw Lucy Taylor who is dying with Brown Long. She got up and she took the mic. She said, Mr. Finley, I worked for you for 47 years. I don't draw that pension because I had to quit. I'm dying with my own. But Mr. Finley, I don't get the pension, but I have to pay for that Social Security that makes the neat little package. I want you people to think about that. 
I want you to think about the little boy who doesn't even have an arm and can't dry on them towels that they hang around in these places. The sheets that these people down in the brown lung can't lay on. And I'm sure you'll leave it laying until we get this settled. We will get it settled. I'm sure we'll get it settled because you people are behind us. There's a lot of interesting citizens behind us, a lot of churches. I know many of you heard me years back when we went to New York City and celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers. And I know how happy our executive board was when we left that convention that we would have a union label we could go out and tell the people, look for that label. We had it made, but not so. The great disease of cancer started to work. Imports, imports. Many of our plants have closed down. Many of the people in this room don't know whether they'll have a job in the next month or not. And yet our union people will go out and they'll come in here with Taiwan shirts, career suits. Why? Don't you like us? I'll tell you, I was in a room last night and one of the uh, boys called some of the girls and wanted to go out dancing. These people won't be able to go out dancing because they won't have a job. And many of the union people are helping them being put in the street. Right in Carbon Hill, Alabama, just a few months ago, we had to go over there and tell those people, due to imports, they're closing the plant down. Sure, they get a little substance, but what, how long will it last? They want dignity. They do not want welfare. And you people can help them by leaving that stuff laying. If you leave it laying and they can't sell it, then they won't buy it because they got to make a living too. How many of you, how many of you men tell me my wife bought this? Tell your wife, honey, we don't want to see these people. They want to educate their children. They want to live a life like they're accustomed to. Don't let that little wife take union money and support people who don't pay taxes and don't do anything. I'll tell you, they'll raise that uh, taxes on you because the people who are fortunate enough to have a job is going to have to pay the welfare because we're going to all be on it. And you know how you would feel. You lose your dignity. And that's what we want. We want jobs. We want to work with our hands. What is a union? A union is people working together for a better life for them and their families. And let me tell you something, all of you, even our people. How many of us support the carpenters, the electricians? Let's think about that. They got to live too. And oh yes, them non-union cigarettes that I see. Some of you try to hide them from me. Don't hide them from me to tell me they'll kill you. I don't know, I've never smoked one. But I think if I was gonna meet my maker, I'd go to them with a good union-made cigarette instead of one of these that's non-union. Laws have been passed that keep us from organizing, but there is no law to govern our power of buying. We can buy where we please, what we please. And my dear fellow union members, for God's sakes, take your money, look for that label, support these people if you want them to come, if you want them to be at this convention, support them. But one thing about it, our dear furniture workers, they got one of the best caskets that you've ever seen. So we can all be buried in a good union made casket if we want to. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate being invited here, Claude, and may I get to come again another time. Now for the drawing. Is he here? All right, R.G., meet me outside. Fanny, please put the suit on it so I won't get mixed up. The next drawing is for a box of shirts. All right, uh, T.G. P.E.S.H. Yeah. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi, is he here? <laughs> 
the Mississippi electrical workers will meet as soon as you adjourn in Paul A. Yes, sir. And before then, I need to meet with the Constitution and Bylaws Committee for about five minutes in the back of the room. Back in the back of the room. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Chair, now recognize uh, Vice President uh, Kelly and the Chairman of the Resolutions Committee. Brother Kelly. Thank you, Cobb. Would each delegate look at the package and turn to resolution number eight? I've got a couple of young ladies who served on the resolution committee, members of the Office Workers Union. They almost thought to see who would be able to read some of these. So Marilyn Ray is going to read resolution number eight. Mary McLeod, out of the Labor's local, is going to follow it up with a resolution that they together submitted. So, Marilyn, come on up and read this resolution. Signified to say an aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so on. Brother Kelly? Mr. McLeod? Yeah, sure. Okay, turn to resolution number 12. Okay. After this resolution is read by Mary McLeod of the Lakers, 
they have asked me to take a few minutes and, and, and make an attempt to explain some of the meaning behind this resolution. Labor Secretary and the OPEI Union Labor. Whereas on August 7, 1975, Local 489 was officially chartered by the Office and Professional Employees International Union, AFL CIO, with the jurisdiction of representing all secretaries who are employed by the labor organization in the state of Mississippi. And whereas OPEIU, Local 489 President, has member working in the following office. Boilermaker Local 4, 693 Pascagoula. Cardinals Local 569 Pascagoula. Cardinals Local 1471 Jackson. CWA Local 10511 Jackson. IBEW Local 605 Jackson. IBEW Local 733 Pascagoula. Labor's Local 1142 Pascagoula. Machinist Local 1133, Pascagoula. Painters Local 1225, Pascagoula. Plumbers and Steam Fitter 436, Pascagoula. And the Mississippi FL CIO. Whereas many labor organizations in the state of Mississippi have secretary in their office who do not belong to Local 489, and therefore do not carry the union labor on their work nor offer their employee the protection of a union contract. And whereas delegates to the convention of the Mississippi FLCIO regularly adopt resolution calling for support of the union labor, organizing the unorganized workers, affiliation, and other working labor ideas. Now therefore be it resolved. The delegates in the ninth by union convention of the Mississippi FLCIO support the rights of the salary secretary of labor organization in the state to belong to the OPEIU Local 489 and encouraging their organization or local union to carry the union labor in their office. Respectfully submitting OPEI Local 489. I hereby move that this resolution be adopted. Motion is to approve resolution number 12. I understand the chairman would like to have a word to say, Brother Kelly. Thank you. I'm Russell Kelly, delegate from District 73 of the Machinist Union. The members of this office employees, Local 489, have been charted by the International to represent all full-time office secretaries that works for local unions, district councils, etc. Now, there's a number of secretaries working, hard secretaries, employees of a local union in Mississippi that does not belong to any union. The office secretaries delegation feel strongly about the situation. We would like to have each and every one of the full-time business reps that has a situation in their office to encourage their secretaries to belong to a union. Now, you have just adopted a resolution calling for organized and unorganized. And we're allowing this type of situation where your secretary working in your office does not have a union contract with negotiated wages, pensions, and benefits in it, and protection. Your work is going out without the union label on it, and you know the importance of that. So, you know, we would like to just get our own stuff together because if some of these companies if you was in an organizing campaign, and they was to discover that your secretary in your office did not have a contract that you could walk in and terminate her tomorrow. You would have a rough time convincing the people in an unorganized plant that need to get in a union because you don't offer your own employees the same privilege. Thank you.
heard the motion and the remarks by Brother Kelly in support of resolution number 12. Do we have any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Brother Schaefer. <laughs> the organization of clerical workers is becoming more prevalent, more vital in the utility industry every day. For example, on Alabama Power Company property, a neighbor of ours to the east, they have a concerted effort to organize now. Every member of the organizing staff of IBEW, with a few exceptions, the exceptions being two or three, are devoting their full time to this effort. It will mean an additional 22 or 2300 to IBEW's unit uh, utility workers on Alabama Fire Company property. The business manager's system council tells me that when this thing got off the ground, this was one of the first things that he was confronted with. His luck would happen. He did have an organized office. Had he not, things would have been a bit of turmoil, if possible. He told me two weeks ago that uh, for some reason, the computer saw that they got a list of the total payroll of the unorganized people in the mail. They reproduced this and published it. This really blew the lid off the uh, general office building of Alabama Fire Company property. They now have suits, two, initiated by individuals, one for $30 million, one for $60 million for the invasion of privacy. Well, no one knows where the privacy came from, but they are getting the attention. The campaign is going good, and hopefully it will be an election uh, on this property within the very near future. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Had they not been organized themselves, the campaign probably would have bogged down before they ever got started. We are organized. You see this. We really appreciate the fact that we can send all of our correspondence out over Union Lake to management as well as our sisters uh, in the organization, the other local youth to thank you. You for the resolution? Yes, sir. Any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Is that all you want to report at this time? Yes, for the time being. Thank you very much, Brother Kelly. Now let's see, almost lunch time. See if we've got some announcements to make before we break for lunch. I've been handed a note. All locals from the South Central Labor Union, as has in Hancock, Stonewall County, Pearl River County, should meet for a few minutes immediately after adjournment in Parlor B, down the hall, B. Any other announcements on meetings in the White House? Brother Knight? I have a couple of announcements here about meetings after adjournment. Now, you know the election will... What's happened to this country? I hadn't said anything all the week. Got up here to talk, this bloomin' thing went nuts. Uh, there's a couple of announcements I'd like to make about a couple of meetings after adjournment now this afternoon. You know, after the election is over, I presume we'll adjourn. So we may not have time to make these announcements again before the election. I've been handed this. There will be a meeting of all unions in Hines, Kapai, Rankin, Simpson, Madison, Yazoo, Scott, and Leak counties after adjournment this afternoon. In other words, the Central Mississippi Central Labor Council. Uh, in Gallery D. Gallery D. All right. <clears throat> Here's another one. All delegates from the 1st Congressional District of Mississippi are asked to assemble here in the convention hall after adjournment. The endorsed candidate for Congress 
The Honorable Gerald Chatham of Atlanta will be here himself. That's all delegates from the 1st Congressional District. What time is that? Immediately after adjournment, meaning after the election's over. Here in this hall. Right? In the convention hall. We have any other announcements? If not, we'll stand in recess for lunch. Get at arms, please get the delegates into the hall. <laughs> Mississippi also over several years. I've had the privilege and opportunity of working with him here in Mississippi on a border restoration and education program for a number of years. He's not a stranger to many of you. Many of you already know our next speaker. But I can tell you he's a hard-working young man. Back a few years ago when we were attempting to, uh, we were doing a lot of voter restoration and education activity in the state, touring the state. Uh, Norm was involved in that situation. And we all wondered if he was going to make the next one, but he always showed up. We never knew what direction he'd be coming from. And I made a remark once that I thought Norman Hill specialized in jumping on and off of airplanes. But he has spent a lot of time in our state, and we do appreciate all of his hard work, activity in our, in our behalf. It's my pleasure now to present to you Mr. Norman Hill, the director of the A. Philip Randolph Institute. Brother Hill. Thank you very much. To Claude Ramsey, Tom Knight, other board members and delegates to the AFL Seattle Convention here in Mississippi Fellow Trade Unions. I'm especially happy to be back here once again in Mississippi because it is here where there is, if ever there is a place where there's dedicated, committed trade unions, it's here in your state. And I want to especially bring you greetings from the leadership of the organization I represent. A. Philip Randolph, who on April 15th had a birthday, making him 89 years young. Now retired as the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, that union having now merged with the Brotherhood of Railway and Airline Clerks. Randolph had a very special view about all of you and each of you in this room but all fellow trade unions. And that view goes something like this. When we in the labor movement approach a plant, a job site, a workplace, we say we want all the workers. We don't stop to ask what the workers' views might be, what his or her religion is, Catholic, Jew, Protestant, Muslim, what the workers' politics might be liberal, reactionary, Democrat, Republican, independent, whether he or she believes in medical care, national health insurance, social security, open housing, racial equality, or even the idea of a union. We say simply this, if he or she works for a living, that worker is entitled to earn a decent living to have some real say about the conditions under which he or she will work. 
to bargain collectively with the boss. In short, we say all centers belong in the church, all workers belong in the union. But then we go on, hopefully, to say something else that was borne out by your day-to-day -day struggles as union members in this very state. The labor movement ought to reflect the very best that's in us. All of us have our prejudices and our hang-ups. But it's through the union we ought to learn, as never before, how to cooperate, how to experience fraternity, how to become solidified around our common objectives as working people. And as important as the workplace is to us, because that's our very bread and butter in our existence, through the union, our sights ought to be lifted beyond the workplace to begin to identify with the interests of others and hopefully make a contribution together towards solving the problems of the larger society which all of us are a part. That was Randolph's view of you. A view that I think is especially relevant here today as you deliberate and make decisions about which direction Mississippi labor will go. I want to review with you this afternoon briefly some of our experiences together in the last few years. I start with 1976, a presidential election year, one of the most critical elections we've experienced in this country's history, in which our bread and butter was at stake in a very serious and real way because we had been through eight years of conservative, anti-worker, anti-union, anti-poor, anti-minority, anti-black rule in the White House. And the key question was whether we could put certain hard-won, hard-fought lessons to work in our own self-interest. <coughs> One of those lessons being what we went at the bargain table, sometimes on a strike or on a picket line, can be taken away from us by some elected official. In your city government, in your state legislature, and most importantly in the White House and the Congress. And you as members of organized labor put that lesson to work like we've never seen in many, many years because we saw close to 70%, seven out of every 10 union blue collar workers vote for Labor's candidate for the President of the United States in 1976. You compare that 70% with the some 53 to 54% of non-union blue collar workers that went the same way for Jimmy Carter in 1976. But along with that, there was another lesson that was put forward most clearly by our national president, the Randolph Institute, by Russell. When in 1964 and 1965, the years we were founded as an organization, he wrote something called From Protest to Politics. He had been a protester much of his life. He was not suggesting that we give up or we abandon protest, because through protest and struggle, you've been able to build your unions. And we've been able to maintain and sustain a movement about justice for minorities, the civil rights movement. But what it was suggesting is this. If that movement that, that was about the rights of people, especially minorities and especially black people, continued to be a relevant, meaningful movement that could speak to the needs of the people it was supposed to represent. That movement had to become a more political movement. Had to become engaged in and interested in politics as never before. Because with the passes of legislation saying it was the law of the land that everybody was to be treated equal, that discrimination and segregation were against the policy of the country, to make the law real in the lives of people which is where it finally counts. The 
decisions of elected officials were especially vital. For example, it did not mean too much to have a national law as we do. As a result of 1968 legislation in the Congress signed into law by the President, saying no more discrimination in the sale or rental of decent housing or good apartments. If a whole lot of us could not afford the money for the down payment, or for the rent, or for the mortgage, we didn't really experience and enjoy what the law was supposed to give us the right to in terms of how we lived, because the opportunity couldn't become real. It was the same for any of our unemployed brothers or sisters, who maybe all of us together now have the right to eat the good meal in the best restaurant in town, but if you couldn't afford it, it was kind of an empty and hollow right. And those who often determined whether or not we had the means to enjoy those rights are elected officials. And politics and political action became a vital, alive necessity for those committed to civil rights in this country. And it was that lesson that is put into practice perhaps as never before in the 1976 election. When we saw 90% of the black vote go solidly for Labour's candidate, Jimmy Carter, in 1976. Where there were some 15 states, including this state of Mississippi, plus the District of Columbia, in which the black vote was greater than the margin by which Carter won the state. To put it another way, you leave aside the black vote in 1976, and the winner the presidential elections would have been four, 51% to Carter's 48%. That was the impact of a labor black alliance working together politically, perhaps as never before in the 1976 elections. But then, where have we come since 1976? We approached this year, 1978, another national election year. Some things that have happened that are good, some things that have happened that are not so good. First, let's talk about the good things. We have seen, since 1976, more and more unity among civil rights and minority organizations around the idea that politics and political action is an absolute necessity to meet people's needs. That's good. Secondly, the one thing that's come home very early in the Carter administration was that as fine and as dedicated and effective trade union lobbyists as we have in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, pressing your interest and your concerns as working people and as union members, that effort will come up short unless we also relate to you, unless we also involve each and every one of you in our day-to-day -day concerns in terms of the issues and the programs and the policies that we're for as working people and as union members. Because it was not so much part of the person that caused us to do together what we did in 1976. It was out of a commitment to policies and programs and concerns that reflect our day-to-day -day interests as working people and as union members. And basically, we judge any elected official in terms of how they relate, how they deal with, how they support or do not support those policies, programs, and concerns. And so whether we're slightest picketty labor law reform, minimum wage, Humphrey Hawkins, you name the issue. But unless you are involved in a day-to-day -day grassroots way, letting your wishes be known in a serious and real and forceful way to your elected representatives, you will not be affected. You will not be affected in Washington, D.C. And that lesson, it's a positive and good one for our entire movement. The third thing that I think is positive 
about what's happened since 1976. More and more, at least at the leadership level. And we would hope that it would be true at the state and the local level as well. The trade union movement and the civil rights community understand the need for strengthening their ties and working together. Not necessarily because we love or like each other, but because out of our experiences coming all too slowly, out of the worst recession or depression since the 1930s, we know as never before that we need each other. Those are the good things. Those are the things, for example, that led Vernon Jordan and other black leaders to criticize the performance of the Carter administration based not on him as a person, but in terms of whether or not there was performance that was meeting the needs and the programs and the policies by which masses of people voted for him in 1976. And it is no accident that the trade union movement only mass institution under the leadership of George Meade came to the defense of Vernon Jordan and other black leaders when they raised that criticism. In turn, we have seen more and more blacks active on the local level around key issues that are central to our trade union program. Not merely out of loyalty to a political ally, but because it is more and more understood that among the mass institutions and organizations in American life, it is the trade union movement, perhaps alone, that has a program that will deal with the needs, the day-to-day -day needs of millions of black workers and their families. That's the positive and that's the good. But I would be less than honest if I didn't share a few words with you this afternoon about what we're up against, especially in 1978. We see around the country a growing anti-move, anti-worker, anti-union, anti-poor, anti-minority, anti-black. In 1977, in almost every single special congressional election that was held, Northern and Western states like the state of Washington, the state of Minnesota, a neighboring southern state in Louisiana, in the New Orleans area, perhaps even in Atlanta, Georgia. Almost without exception in every single special congressional election, the anti-worker, anti-union, anti-poor, anti-minority congressional candidate won. Evidence of a mood that's anti-us in the country. Second, the major central concern around which the 76 elections turned, I believe, for all of us as working people and as union members, was the key, most vital concern of jobs and whether or not the country would move in a real, serious, and forceful way toward full employment that there would be a decent job and good pay with a future attached for any and everybody who was willing and able to work. And we have seen some progress made in that direction. The progress, however, measured against the need, measured against those who still lack work, who needed and who are seeking, is inadequate. So much so that we can say in a genuine and real way, that unless there is more forceful action, <coughs> we may see a whole generation of youth, especially minority or black youth, that may never know what it is to work. That's how serious the situation is. Thirdly, the antis are doing their thing. I'm talking about those who are anti-us. They could always outspend us. That's not really new. They always had more money than we did. 
that could use and control the radio and the television and newspapers. But what is new? They are trying as never before to get inside and take over and infiltrate our own very movement, the movement for justice for working people. They are trying as never before to borrow our own grassroots organizing techniques and mobilize their folk in a day-to-day -day way against us and key to their whole game plan is to take away the hard-won, hard-fought gains of working people, poor people, and minorities. In fact, their real strategy is not just to weaken, but to destroy the trade union movement. Those are the stakes in 1978. What then do we do? Do we give up? Do we cry and go home and say there's nothing that can be done? I would hope not. Because our tradition is a fighting tradition in the labor movement. Our tradition is not to give up, but to fight back. And so we, we see an administration that on the one hand talks in a very positive way and makes some moves in the best tradition of this country, <coughs> developing and working for and pushing for programs that have at best central interests, the concerns and needs of those of us as working people who make up the majority of the American people. In the tradition of the New Deal of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Fair Deal of Harry Truman, and the Great Society of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And we've been able to push and prod that administration to take certain initiatives in manpower, in urban programs, in other areas that are to the good. But on the other hand, that same administration talks about balancing the budget, reorganizing the government, restoring big business confidence, as if that was what they really needed instead of paying customers who have real jobs with which they can buy the goods that are produced by you as working people. But out of the whole situation, because there clearly is a difference between the response of this administration and that of the previous Nixon Ford administration, there comes one lesson, one lesson clearly home to all of us. That is, even a more sympathetic administration as this is, will not do our job for us. Like all elected officials, they respond to an organized, concerned, educated, and mobilized public. And that's our job. That's our day-to-day -day job as working people and as union members. And so I would like to summarize what I'm trying to say by suggesting a four-part challenge that all of us face together. First, we have a continuing challenge to be day-to-day -day community leaders. Why do I say that? With all of the performance that was good and positive by people like yourselves in the 76 elections, the painful fact is a little over half of the American people went to the polls. Only one out of every three black people went to the polls in 1976. That performance simply is not good enough if we're concerned about expanding democracy and about making this country and its government more responsive to the needs of working people, union members, and poor people, and minorities. We need all of you to be day-to-day -day community leaders backed and supported by your unions, to demonstrate that you don't have to be rich to have some impact in politics, that you don't have to have some special fix or clout to influence not only who gets elected, but the performance of elected officials and what they do once they're in office. Secondly, 
I would suspect that each of your communities have one thing in common. They may be different in a whole lot of other ways. But one thing in common. There are some people in those communities, hopefully only some, who play politics not as a part of our total team, not as a part of our, our united, hopefully strengthened, labor black alliance. We look upon politics in terms of who's going to grease their palm the most, who's going to fatten their pocketbook, their purse, or their wallet, and are willing to sell you out for a few dollars come each and every election day. We need all of you to be the voice of militant responsibility against that kind of politics. Thirdly, there's a very special story that we need each of you to tell. A story that will not be told by the radio and the television and the newspapers. You can only do it person to person, mouth to mouth, in your neighborhood among all your friends, whether they're union members or not. We've got to find a way to tell that story. I'm reminded of one incident which a woman went to a butcher shop looking for a piece of meat to make some soup. And she saw a calf's head that could meet her budget and fit her pocketbook. And she said to the butcher, that's what I want. And just as she was about to buy it, she looked up on the wall and saw that she was in a union shop. She said to the butcher, no, 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 I can't take it. I'm against unions. I hate unions. I want non-union, unorganized meat. And so the butcher thought real fast because he didn't want to give up the sale. He went to the back of the store, came back wrapping up a piece of meat. And the woman said, wait a minute. Isn't that the same piece of meat that I told you I didn't want? She said, yes, it is. But I went back and I thought real fast and tried to figure out how I could really sell that piece of meat to you. And the only thing I could do was to go back to the back of the store and beat the brains out of the cab. Because that's the only way I could sell it to you is a non-union meat. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that we have to find a way to tell our trade union story. Not that our movement is perfect. Not that we don't have problems. For example, we know that a union worker earns $2,000 more than that same worker who doesn't have that union card on the average each and every year. And that's a very good bread and butter reason for talking about the value of the union card. Finally, we have a major task ahead of us. That's the move from what I call the politics of symbolism to the politics of results. We have reached a stage, thanks to the struggles of many of you in this room, where it is possible for minorities, blacks, Latinos, and women to function and be recognized at the very highest levels of American politics. The so black mayor in New Orleans, black mayor in Atlanta, Georgia, Black mayor in the third largest city in the country, Los Angeles, where the black vote is only 18% of the total vote. It's meant he got a whole lot of white votes as well. There are women in Congress. A stirring keynote address in the 1976 Democratic Party convention was one of the highlights. That was given by a black congresswoman from a southern state. Barbara Jordan from Texas. So it is possible, it's been proven out of the struggles of many of you in this room, that minorities and women can function and be recognized at the very highest levels of American politics. But I would suggest that that's not good enough. Because for that some 40 some odd percent that was not engaged in politics in 1976, the key for them is the politics of results. And it ought to be for all of us in this room as well. 
no matter who the candidate might be, black, Latino, white, young, old, male, or female, is that candidate or elected official prepared to stand up and fight for what's good for us? Is he or she committed to the programs and policies that make life better for the overwhelming majority of Americans who are working people? That ought to be the key to judging any and all candidates for us. We still have one good thing on our side. Come each and every election day, when we go into that polling place, what they will ask us is not how much money we make, but whether or not we've got that registration card. And there continue to be more of us than there are of them if we get our thing together. And so it would seem to me that we ought to be about moving your city and this state together with the rest of the trade union movement and our minority labor alliance, moving the country from the politics of symbolism to the politics of results. And that means saying to elected officials, you ought to go with us and see what it's like to stand in the line, that unemployment line, when one of our brothers or sisters doesn't have a job and hopes to get it all to an inadequate unemployment check, and has to come back the next time after qualifying and hope they actually get the check. Maybe these same elected officials ought to be coming home to an unemployed brother or sister of ours and seeing for themselves what it's like to have to make painful, difficult choices between medicine and milk when you don't have adequate income or a regular paycheck for your family. And maybe, just maybe, when they begin to see, feel, taste, and touch our problems, they'll behave and act differently as elected officials. A. Philip Randolph said it best when he said there are no reserved seats at the banquet table of nature. One gets what one takes and keeps what one holds. I hope you use this convention to keep on with his principles and to keep on struggling to make this state and the country what it ought to be, a country which is racially calling economic justice, and social democracy for all Americans. Thank you. States to come, not just one or two states. Now, the <clears throat> next item on our program is listed as comments by the two co chair, co chair men or persons that you call yourself, Doc, of the Democratic Party, uh, and Henry and Tom Bradell. Tom Bradell got called out of the state, said where he wouldn't be able to make it, but we do have our good friend. Aaron Henry <coughs> with us now. I <coughs> want you to know that Doc's been sitting in this convention uh, ever since we got started. And he's been here watching to see how this organization functions. So I'm sure he's got a, a lot of comments for you. But let me say this about Dr. Henry. I've known him for a number of years. And he's come to the aid and assistance of the labor movement in this state on numerous occasions that relates to organizing activity. Any time that Doc Henry could be of any help in one of these situations, he'd go there. I just can't forget about the time not too long ago that I carried him down to Macomb, Mississippi, 
where we had a strike at the Vandroff plant. And I, I've been going down regular trying to boost up the morale. And so I hauled him off down there one night with me. And he gave his usual, did his usual splendid job in that situation. Then what you think he wanted to do? <clears throat> After the meeting was over, over with, there about 11 o'clock at night, he had to go down and walk that picket line for a few minutes. So he went down and walked up down that plant for a few minutes. And I told him, I said, Doc, we're going to have to get you back down here with some of the TV cameras around and, and some folks can get a few pictures. But anyhow, <clears throat> Doc is a friend of ours. I've had the pleasure of working with him over a long period of years. <clears throat> This point is my pleasure to present to you, Dr. Aaron Henry of Clarksdale, Mississippi. Let me respond to Brother Adams' introduction by saying that it is certainly an equal pleasure for me to be involved and included in the <clears throat> activities of AFL-CIO because there is really a commonality between the issues that we try to resolve within the NAACP, the Democratic Party, or the AFL-CIO. It seems that we generally end up with the same friends or the same enemies. And as it has been mine to, to be about an observation of what the AFL CIO has been about, certainly my identification and association across the board with people like Robert Woodson and Wilson Evans. I found Dan Ory up in Washington the other day. He's still trying to figure out how we found him. Alan Johnson, who is here, and that Ray Smith Hart that has been so helpful in so many ways in many of the activities in which we were concerned. Tom Knight and Claude Ramsey and a whole host of other people who are here. I don't think, though, that I'm proud of to see any other one person here than I am with regard to a little running battle that we've had with regard to the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway. And again, the welfare of NACP, the black community, labor, FBL, CIO, was intertwined in terms of what was good for one of us was good for both of us, and what was bad for either of us was bad for both of us. And I found myself two or three times trying to sit around the conference table with Colonel Blaylock from the Army Corps of Engineers and Claude Ramsey from AFL CIO and Ben Splain from the Operating Engineers. And I said, now this don't make no sense. I said, Benny, why don't you get your fanny in AFL CIO? So we argued at this point back and forth, and Benny said, you know, we got a little problem with that, but give me a little time, we'll probably work it out. But I'm very proud that one of the first persons that I've met here today, and one of the most courageous activities within this state that's going on right now, in terms of making life a little easier for all of the people of our state has been explained. And Ben, I'm glad to see you, Ben. <laughs> Certainly my opportunity at this time is from very broad range. I'm postured for comments. And that gives me the waterfront. Certainly being involved with Norm Hill through the years and in all of the civil rights activities, we were on the Selma to Montgomery March together, the Washington DC March, the Mississippi March. Many of us who somehow coalesce 
at the leadership area of both NAACP and AFL CIO, find ourselves having come through so many common difficulties together that it creates a kind of bond between us that really almost makes it impossible for any other force to penetrate that operation. And to have sat here and to have heard Norman from A. Philip Randolph Foundation and hearing within his voice the, the instructions of, of Bad Rustin, who for years was the chairman of that organization and is still so closely affiliated with it, and I'm sure that the name Bad Rustin is familiar to almost everybody here. But it is that kind of interrelationship that we've had that gives me the latitude and the freedom to feel that I can speak with you and I would do it anyway, as openly and as freely as I think that uh, I ought to comment. Certainly with being postured from the Democratic Party, and I'm sorry that Tom couldn't make it today, as Claude mentioned, Tom was called out of the city. And he did call to let us know that he couldn't be here. And I can understand from Claude that's that's better than Cliff Finch did. Cliff didn't call <laughs> to let you know that he wouldn't be here. But you know, as I looked at, I was here during the election yesterday, and I saw all of the nuances and Anybody who thinks that Claude is a czar, you know, have not been to an AFL-CIO convention because Claude was just as lost as the rest of us. Because he didn't know how the thing was going to come out. And you know, the black community and the AFL-CIO certainly have a commonality, and we've tried many times, even when it was most difficult, to try to ally, ally ourselves in the same general area. Now, we have a common problem on opposite sides at this point. You've got the same problem with Cliff Fetch that we've got with Maurice Danton. Maurice Danton has made no effort to penetrate the black community, just like Cliff Fetch he made no effort to penetrate FLCIO. So both of you got to hang up this time. So hopefully that somewhere down through the milieu of politics in this state that we will find a commonality and that the two of us can march together again in victory as we did in the last governor's race, as we did in the most recent presidential election, and as we hope to do time and time again. Now let me get on to a little bit of the importance of where the Democratic Party is at this position. I would bet about half of us in this House does not know that there is a National Democratic Convention in December of this year. How many did not know that? There is a Democratic Convention in December, in Memphis, Tennessee, the rules for delegate selection through the information process have already been developed, and we would certainly hope that the members of AFL-CIO would become familiar with the affirmative action plan and the delegate selection rules for the process begins, I believe, September 9th, 1978, which is the precinct convention. And the county convention follows on September 16th, and there's a district convention that follows that on September 30th. I will not try to get into the intricacies of the plan, but I will certainly leave a copy of the plan with, with Claude, and I know all of the 
duplicating equipment he has around there, that it won't be too difficult for him to reproduce the plan in sufficient quantities so that every member of AFL CIO and friends of AFL CIO, because we're going to need a few more copies of the Democratic Party Club, will be able to, to do that. So I'm going to lay this one on you right now. <laughs> how many you want? Oh, well, we can use about 100, but I guess you said that, but I don't know how many you need for the AFL CIO. You want 100? Maybe. Yeah. Let me take just a few moments to deal with a few other community problems that, that affect us all, some more genuinely or more painfully in one community or another, but certainly what benefits one of us benefits all of us in the long run. There is a problem at this point with a companion program that's called Head Start that fortunately in Mississippi operates in every county in the state. And I'm sure that many of us understand that were it not for the overall support of, of our friends in the Congress toward several labor reform bills, and particularly the minimum wage bill, that the workers of the various programs, in particular Head Start, would not today be covered by the minimum wage law and also the affirmative action procedures that are instilled into that program. The dangers right now are two. One is that there is a good possibility that the Head Start program can be shifted from the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to a new department that the President is setting up called the Department of Education. Our fear there is that once the, the Department of Education gets the Head Start program, that the Head Start program then is going to come under the school boards, and the school boards are going to require a credentialized program and the only people who are working in Head Start are then going to be people who have to have degrees in childhood education, and et cetera. I think you know that they are the backbone of the Head Start movement today are people who were not fortunate enough to get a college degree in childhood education. They are the parents and friends, and they are the poverty-stricken people of our state. And for the Head Start program to be shifted under the Department of Education is going to leave a heavy boy in terms of the employment of people who are not credentialized with A, B, or BS degrees to be able to foster that. And the there are some of us who are not as impressed with degrees as other people. Now, I feel that whether your degree came from Yale or by mail, <laughs> it does not require that kind of identity or authenticity to participate in the Head Start program. And the same goes to whether you came from Mohawk I know how. The logic is the same. And sometimes, you know, we talk about BS and MS and PhDs. They've got some connotations too that I tell Claude about. I won't tell you about the ladies in the house. You already know about it. <laughs> All right. The second problem however, centers itself around the funding issue. In spite of the fact that we've had governors in this state like John Bell Williams and Bill Waller, who vetoed every program that was for the benefit of poor whites and blacks in this state, 
Frankly, we spend as much time in Washington getting John Bell Williams and Bill Waller overwritten as we did filing proposals for the program. But in spite of the fact that we have spent and we were involved in and engaged in trying to get funding sufficient for the operation of Head Start, Mississippi now gets $47 million a year in the overall Head Start program. We get more money in Head Start than any other state in the nation. It's good to be top of something, man. Yeah. But we're usually on the bottom of everything. Now, the movement among some other states is that we equalize the Head Start appropriation. And of course, by equalizing the Head Start appropriations means a reduction of $10 million a year for the next four years in Mississippi, which would have the effect of removing 3,000 children from the program and 600 positions in employment. And certainly we would like for this to become an attention item on the agenda of AFL CIO. So as we continue to proceed with the lobbying efforts of trying to prevent the reduction of funding in a program that benefits all of us in Mississippi, that you too would be involved and concerned to try to make sure that this reduction in funding does not happen. However, we do have another problem that's more serious in Head Start than those two. Unfortunately, we've got some people who are engaged in the Head Start program that won't do right. There are three programs in this state that threatens to pull the tent down on all of us. The one in Jackson County, the one in Harrison County, and the one that's operated by CE, Continued Education. The responsibility of the Head Start leaders and the friends of you who are engaged and know the directors and the program operators of these programs, I think, have the responsibility and the obligation of trying to sit down with them and try to make sure that the programs are operated according to rules and regulations. Now, you know, some of those operators are stupid enough to say that just because the federal government put that money down here, they can't tell us how to spend it. Well, you're crazy as hell if you don't think they're going to tell you how to spend it. <coughs> but I don't want to ask Claude Ramos to spend his time, and I certainly don't intend to spend my time going all over this country trying to save Head Start for people who will not operate the programs right. I do not condone shoddy actions. I do not condone operating outside of the guidelines of programs. The, when you undertake to operate a Head Start program, when you do that, you assume the obligation and the responsibility of playing by the rules. And to do otherwise, you make it so much more difficult for us to fight the battle on the other two levels. Because as long as those who are against Head Start can also show that since Mississippi gets $47 million, they got some programs down there, look how they operate. That gives our opposition far more ammunition to fight us with. So we would want again to caution all of us who are trying to become involved and participate with our citizens in these total programs to try to make sure that they're operating according to rules and regulations. Now all of the pro problems that we have as far as the poor white and black community of this state are not necessarily rooted in federal programs. Much of our all, much also of our problem 
is rooted in the disastrous discrimination that is based in the area of state and federal employment. The black community of this state is better than 37%. We have less than 4% of the total employment on the state payroll. We ain't gonna take that no longer. The Justice Department in this state is just as phony as a town in Mississippi called Liberty. And the Justice Department ought to be the epitome of trying to make sure that all things are done right. And we have as much problem getting FBI and the United States Department of Justice to live up to affirmative action and fair play as we more so than we do many of the state agencies or other federal employment structures. Now I think it's a question of attention getting. I think that we're going to have to make ourselves completely understood I think one of the things we do, particularly in the black community, is that when we address the white establishment, or when the white establishment addresses us about what is it that it ought to be doing, we start grinning when we ain't tickled, and scratching where we ain't itching. <laughs> And we are too intimidated to say to the white establishment that this is wrong or that's wrong. And we ain't gonna put up with it no more. Until we, you see, all the problems that black folks have in this nation and in this state is not because of white folks. Many of our problems are ours ourselves. When we do not perform in a manner necessary as adult men and women. And when you let some member of the white community slap you on the back and say, you know, if all black folks was like you, everything would be all right. And there you go down the road, damn fool, take it means. <laughs> You're going to have to learn the lesson that one strawberry told the other one day when they found themselves in a jar jam. They said, if we hadn't been in the bed together, we wouldn't be in this jam today. <laughs> because when head cutting time comes on the race issue, yours go too. And in trying to make ourselves completely understood, I think the best analogy that we could use so that, that uh, really drives the message home, because it does a little bit with our ego. There is a story that's been told by a good friend of mine named Burns about a, a minister who on one occasion decided to go to church on Sunday. And he told his wife, who, as they had just left the beach, and he had observed the water skiers with their great amounts of dexterity as they zipped through the water, that, you know, when I go to church Sunday, he said, I'm going to preach about water skiing. His wife said, you don't know nothing about it. And I'm not going to go to church with you and hear you make a fool out of yourself preaching about something you don't know nothing about. He said, yes, but if I could correlate the dexterity of the water skills, my understanding of the Holy Scripture, I believe I would have made a great impression on our congregation. So they finally went to bed, and the wife said, well, I tell you what, don't bother to wake me up in the morning, because I'm not going to go to church and hear you make a fool of yourself. So during the night, the minister finally decided he would change his mind, and he would go to church Sunday and preach about something that he knew something about, but he didn't. He forgot to inform his wife that he was not going to preach about water skiing. So when he got 
to up the next morning, he decided he would go to church and preach about sex. I mean, he had some idea, something about it. <laughs> so he took his text and he was talking about the procreation and how wonderful it was that God installed the, the activity of sex into the total family and how procreation was a part of all of this and how so many great people had come about in the only way that they could have developed as human beings was through the sex act and he really had done a good job about tying humanity and procreation together. But one of the ladies who was at church went down to the grocery store the next morning and he saw the preacher's wife. The preacher still, preacher's wife still thought he was preaching about water skiing in church. So the ladies saw, the, 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 the member of the church saw the preacher's wife and she said, Mr. Preacher, said, why weren't you at church Sunday? He said, child, you should have heard your husband. Say, he really preached. He really had us throwing pocketbooks and knocking them out. So his wife looked at her and she said, well, that's funny. He knows nothing about what he's talking about. <laughs> so she said, honey, yeah, but you should have been there. Well, he really took that text and taught us all about what living is really about. He said, ain't that something? He ain't never tried it but twice. <laughs> <laughs> he said, but honey, if you had been there, you would have really been proud of your husband because he was so dynamic and so interesting in all that he had to say. And the wife said, Jesus Christ, he fell off both times. <laughs> So that is a real necessity of being sure that you understood when you try to deal with a subject that's important to you. And let us not be too complacent about the gains we've made and about the distance we've gone. We have developed a communication within the Democratic Party that deals with what we consider a part of the attributes of the Democratic Party and what it has stood for. And of course, third on this list is the right of organized labor to organize. We give credence to the Wagner Act. And if you would take the time to digest this whole list of Democratic Party principles and we go from A to Z. We believe that you too will have some appreciation for, rather more appreciation, for what the Democratic Party has stood for. But I want us to understand and to know that all of what we have gained is not necessarily sealed in concrete, is not necessarily permanent, because there are forces in this nation, there are forces in this Congress that will turn back all of the gains we made. And again, relying upon our understanding of American literature, I'd like to hurriedly give you the interpretation of, of Ernest Hemingway's Old Man and the Sea. As he spoke about a fisherman who lived in the country of Chile by the name of Santiago. And Santiago went out on a fishing expedition one day and he was determined to catch what was the biggest fish any man had ever caught and carry it back to Chile and show his friends what an outstanding fisherman that he was. So about third days, three days out to sea, the third day, he landed what he thought was the largest fish he could catch. 
and he tied it on the side of his boat, and he went rowing back to Chuck. But one thing he forgot about that I'm asking you not to forget about today. He forgot about the sharks in the water. While he was on his way back to Chile, one shark came up and took one bite out of his fish, and half of his fish was gone. Before he got back to Chile, he'd run into a whole school of sharks, and they devoured all of the flesh from the fish. And all he had to show when he got back to Chile was a bag of bones. So we can't forget about the, the advancement we've made. We can't forget about how tedious and how hard they were to gain <coughs> by becoming lethargic and parking by our successes and let the sharks in the water take us over. And as we continue in all the struggles you have, and in all the opportunities that you have for a better day and clog all of the, the issues of happiness and sorrow and good luck and bad luck and, and all of the nuances of a convention and a year-to-year -year operation of FLCIO, certainly there's going to be some bad times and some good times. But I'd like to leave with you a quote that I've learned the other day from the new executive director of the NAACP. It's a Latin idiom, and it's called illegitimate non carburante. Translate, don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs>
We're going to do this. I, what this conference has been about, we've got the, a representative for the Retail Clerks Union here with us. I introduced him earlier. And I'd like to call up the resolution dealing with the women. Uh, Dixie boycott. As soon as we can get it in the hall where Wally is present and let him speak on this matter. This way he can get out in the morning. Now while we're waiting on that resolution, they're going to bring it in in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to recognize the chairman of the resolutions committee. I understand he's got a couple of resolutions he has ready to report on. Brother Kelly. Okay, let's turn to re resolution number six. We have a committee that's known as a working committee. We're going to let everyone have a part on it. So, Joanne Bolden is going to read number six. Contracting out of government work. Whereas the federal government estimates that it will spend $80 billion during this fiscal year on contract goods and services, and whereas the overwhelming majority of that money will be spent on firms which pay substandard non-union wages, depriving union workers in the state of Mississippi and elsewhere of their jobs, and whereas it represents a vast waste of tax money for which the government has very little accountability to taxpayers. Now therefore be it resolved that the Mississippi AFL-CIO hereby records its opposition to government policies which enlarge or perpetuate wasteful contracting out policies. Respectfully submitted, East Central Mississippi Labor Council, endorsed by Mississippi Association of Central Labor Unions. I hereby move that this resolution be adopted. You heard the committee's report or motion to adopt resolution number six. Do we have any discussion on that motion? That's why it's Morris Adam playing up there on that, uh, on that mic. This thinks the people he represents, he must not be here. They, uh, Mr. Adams, I, I, thought, uh, I thought I'd get a word out of you on that. You asked for it. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, I thought that this uh, resolution would unanimously carry. I think it will, but I think you need to tell them what the problem is. The problem is that under the procedures that's barred, a contractor must come in and show that the work to be done can be done by the contractor at a 10% savings to the taxpayers. Uh, I can give you a small example of how this works. Six years ago, Parts of the food service area in Keesler was contracted out for $800,000, showing a 10% savings over how, how much we could do it in house. At that time, we had eight mess facilities at Keesler. Today, we've got six mess facilities. That same contract is costing the taxpayers $2.5 million per year. That's how much it's gone up during the six years. At the same time, the contract was let for 190 people. The contractor has 285 people on the payroll, working each one approximately five days, five hours per day. In other words, not one of them get a full uh, paycheck each two weeks, which means that the taxpayers are hit again by these same people going down and signing up a $200 worth of food stamps. They're eligible for it. The same thing, though, applies, and I believe perhaps that the reason I didn't really hop up in a hurry on this particular resolution, I think the people are concerned that contractors come in and uh, do work like new buildings and, and uh, stuff like this. They come in and they do not, are not required and will not uh, hire a union labor. Of course, this is not a problem that affects uh, federal employees. It does, of course, affect all the private sector. And that's why I didn't offer. It but does. I, this practice, though, has been eliminating a lot of people that you've been representing, hasn't it? 
and eliminates a lot of people from the base. Members of your union have been, been moved out because of this practice. We have another discussion on the motion to adopt resolution number six. All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Brother Kelly. Then got 16 out yet, have they? 15. 15. Has everyone got a copy of 15? situation to you where you'll have more knowledge of it before we'll put the question for a vote. Brother, come on. Thank you, President Ramsey. I think you can tell that the resolution was drafted by an attorney with all the high blue uh, language in it. I'm going to try to, to cut through some of the language now. Some 20 months ago, Wynn Dixie purchased 140 stores of the Kimball Company based in Fort Worth, Texas. And in so doing, they purchased 20 stores that were already union in the state of New Mexico. Within three months, a record of 25 years of labor peace went down the tube. 
342 days ago, a small group of our members took on this corporate giant. Only two stores out of 1,164 stores were initially on strike. Only 51 out of 51,000 employees. Win Dixie laughed at us. They were talking about our Las Cruces local, one of our smaller locals, and they said, how can a small broke union take on Win Dixie and hope to survive? On Christmas Eve, the same gentleman said, valor is one thing, but profits is something else. Amen. When they closed the store in Carlsbad, New Mexico, the first victim of a United Labor Front. That store in Carlsbad, New Mexico stands vacant today as a silent testimonial to the guts and solidarity of the members of that small broke union. The strike spread. In December, the 14 northern New Mexico stores were struck. In January, the Meat Cutters Union joined us at 16 stores. The issues were the same. Win Dixie simply told us that they did not operate union. They unveiled their five-year plan to get rid of unions and told us they were willing to spend millions of dollars to deprive us of our American rights to join, form, or assist the union of our choice. They told us they had budgeted $20 million to deprive 400 New Mexico citizens of their right to have a union. That's $50,000 per employee. They even contributed heavily to the Right to Work Committee in New Mexico. And although we were successful in 1977, we face another difficult fight next year. In their first year in New Mexico, Win Dixie committed 26 separate violations of federal labor laws. Violating the law is old hat to win Dixie. They have been forced by the federal government to sign consent orders alleging price fixing, restraint of trade, as well as being charged with scores of EEOC and OSHA violations. And in 1975, they were found to have violated the Fair Labor Standard Act, the Minimum Wage Act, and ordered to pay $1 million to their employees for violation of minimum wage provisions. It appears that they're in a race with the J.P. Stevens Company to see who can be the biggest corporate law, uh, labor law violator in the South. I'd like to share with you some remarks that were made by Roy Shirek, who was the vice president of the uh, Mount Bay Meat Cutters Union. He made these remarks before a congressional committee. And in closing his remarks, Vice President Shirek said, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen of the committee, we have shown how a powerful and rich corporation can successfully frustrate the efforts of its employees to organize into unions. It can disregard the labor laws. It can willfully disobey the orders of the NLRB. It can refuse to comply with the orders of the courts. While the company has undertaken all of these violations and all this contempt of law in the courts, not a single one of the owners and top policy makers of Winn-Dixie has been called to account. Despite numerous NLRB cases and orders, despite court decisions, despite the Supreme Court permitting these orders to stand, Winn-Dixie still does not bargain in good faith. No labor management agreement benefits any of its employees. Can this company successfully thumb its nose at the law does its money and its power and its lawyers allow it to be above the law? Can it undertake illegal actions? And can it disregard the courts without punishment or remedy? We respectfully suggest that this committee and the Congress have much work to do. You should assure that labor laws are to be meaningful and effective in guaranteeing employees the right to organize in any company or anywhere in the nation. The opportunities to stall, to coerce, to frustrate, and to prevent employee organization, which is currently built into labor law and its administration, should be terminated. What better testimonial in favor of labor law is that? <coughs> but brothers and sisters, his appearance was on August the 18th of 1967, over 10 and a half years ago. The employees he was referring to had been organized in 1964. Today, 14 years later, the issue is still in the courts. The courageous employees in Jacksonville have not lost faith in their union. 
only in the laws which are supposed to protect workers in this country. And their vision of the American ideal of justice has been irreparably damaged. Brothers and sisters, we will carry this boycott from the mountains and the prairies of New Mexico to the oceans of the Gulf and Atlantic seaboards, to all 1,164 stores in all 14 states. Justice sometimes is a formidable task. We cannot do it alone. We ask for your wholehearted endorsement. We ask for you to pass the resolution here today. We ask for you and your families to help us spread the word to boycott the 31 Winn-Dixie stores in Mississippi. There are several things you can do to help. In the very near future, we hope to have bumper stickers. And these bumper stickers are available. We'll distribute them to the different locals. We hope that you'll help us spread the word by putting the sticker on your car. Uh, we hope that you'll spread the word among your families, your relatives, and your friends. If you, families have been shopping there and you have a, a Winn-Dixie check cashing card, mail it back to the company with a note. It only takes a few seconds. You might do it during a television commercial, but get on the phone, call that store manager, let him know that you're not shopping at Winn-Dixie, and tell him why you're not shopping at Winn-Dixie. And you can spread the word through your churches, through your uh, civic organizations, through your locals, and through your clubs. At this point, I'd like to introduce an international representative of the Retail Clerks Union who is assigned uh, to coordinate our activities in Mississippi as well as in uh, Louisiana. Sister Carolyn Creon is assigned full-time to this uh, task. She's got a very difficult job ahead. I hope that uh, before the convention is over, you'll come by stop and uh, introduce yourself to her, give her your business card, and uh, as her travel, bring her to your uh, area. She'll have some contacts where we can begin the task of, of not only carrying the message to union people, but also to the consumers and, and to the uh, uh, buying public in Mississippi. With the inspiration from the Winn-Dixie strikers, with the faith and confidence in the Almighty, and with the support of dedicated trade unionists such as gathered here today, we will be successful. We've got a long road to hold, and we ask for your blessing and your endorsement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have another discussion on the resolution. Mr. President, I'd like to tell another story. Give us your name and local first, please. Dwayne Copeland, Local 733. I am involved with a volunteer fire department on the coast. And we have never been able to get a contribution <coughs> from Winn Dixie, although we have fought three of their fires. After checking through many of the community organizations, there is almost none that get a contribution from that parasite of our community. I felt that union members as community loving, hardworking people in our communities should know what kind of a parasite we have in the Winn-Dixie store. We have contacted the uh, manager at the store in St. Martin, north, in North Biloxi, and he con told us to contact the home office, gave us the address, and in two years of writing them, we haven't even as much as been afforded the polite re a polite return uh, so I just wanted our brothers and sisters to know that there's not only a union side of this there is also a community action side thank you any further discussion all in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number 15, I believe it is, 
Signify for saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so on. Well, it's now 3.20, and obviously we need to <clears throat> suspend the business on resolutions. Now I call for the <clears throat> final report <clears throat> of the Credentials Committee, Brother Jackson. Thank you, Claude. In the final registration, we registered 278 delegates, 63 guests representing 121 organizations. I move the adoption of the final report. committee <clears throat> and the motion is to seat all delegates have been issued badges of certification. We have any discussion on that motion? Not all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Brother Jackson, let me say we appreciate the good job your committee has done. As this concludes the work of this committee, I'd like for it to be dismissed with the thanks of the convention. Thank you, brother. Let's get <laughs> Brother Wood? Brother Wood? <laughs> Chairman of the Elections Committee. I hope he's in the house. <coughs> the chairman of our elections committee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, you're ready to go. Yeah, well, all the members of the election committee, let me read the name out again, to report to the podium to conduct the election. Yeah. Yeah. W.H. Wood, Chairman, Edna Carter, A.L. Shiles, Ernestine Jordan, and W.C. Peterson. Now, I've been advised by my secretary that there <clears throat> was a an error made in the ballot. I don't know, they misunderstood the town that Mary Tucker come from, and it'd be listed as Louisville, but she lives in Columbus, no problem. Just wanted to know a simple an error there. Mary is actually from Columbus and not Louisville, okay? Brother Wood, it's all yours. Get your crowd up here. This committee conduct the election. Let's see if we got any announcements needs to be made before we 